Hello, everybody. Eighteen plus me, that's not a bad number. Okay, so <laughs> I've got one person, two people with their cameras on. Okay, so here's the deal, folks. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, and I'm going to put this in the chat as well. Um, we need to GME, what's that mean? Hi folks, today I am asking that you turn on your cameras so I don't feel so alone. <laughs> You don't have to turn on your microphone. In fact, it's probably better if you leave it off until you're ready to speak so that we don't get any feedback or anything like that on the on the audio. Um, but what I will ask, oh, yay, more folks. What I will ask is that you turn on your cameras um, so that we're all present and we all have a sense of what's going on here. And I can see your faces as you get confused with what I'm going to tell you today. No, I'm kidding. It's going to be fine. <clears throat> Unless you have a real good reason uh, to leave your camera off, I'd like everyone to turn their cameras on if you don't mind. Because otherwise I look at a bunch of black cards with names on it and microphones crossed out and it feels like I'm talking to myself. Okay, anybody else need to come in? Here we go. Adrian's waiting. 24 folks. Thank you for everyone who has shown up today. Appreciate that. This is a good number. I'm going to wait one more minute and if uh, nobody else straggles in, we'll, uh, we'll begin. How's everybody doing? So today I'm in my podcasting room uh, instead of in my dining room, <laughs> just in case I have to uh, grab some propage along the way. I've got uh, several cameras and lenses laying around in here that I can grab at a moment's notice if, uh, if it helps with the presentation at all, which it may very well. I don't know. Maybe will, maybe it won't. Um, but today, all right, let me share my screen because I want to do that with you. Let's go to the desktop. Um, today, here's section four on web courses. We're going to talk about digital media and digital capture. So this is going to be our first kind of technical conversation we've had so far this semester. Um, it's been a little bit of warming up and a little bit of softballing and some discussions and a little bit of uh, online research. Now I want to start talking to you about technical concepts. Okay. Um, 
but here's what I don't want to do. So some of you, I don't want to overwhelm those of you who are having this conversation for the first time. So if there are individuals among you who, um, you know, have heard all this before, and this is kind of old hat to you, I'm going to ask uh, two things from you. First, uh, please bear with me. And um, maybe there'll be something we talk about that you haven't heard yet. Um, and also, um, let's engage in some conversation then for the benefit of those who have never sort of encountered this before or who are addressing these topics for the first time. Uh, see if we can't get a little back and forth going here um, and help out, you know, our colleagues who are, you know, um, who need to be brought up to speed. Okay. And I'm going to go slow um, so that, you know, because this, my friends, can be a rabbit hole if you really want it to be. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want it to start getting so technical and weird that it becomes, um, you know, uh, tedious or uh, boring or just ridiculous. So uh, and if you start feeling those things, um, let me know and we'll see if there's a way to address that. Um, but what I want to cover is digital media. Uh, and I want to talk about um, some of your cameras internals um, and how it relates to your digital media and your digital media choices. Uh, and then I'll show you what we've got a little um, assignment for you to do this week. I think it's pretty simple and straightforward. It's like a little worksheet for you to do as a homework assignment. Um, and hopefully this conversation will be helpful to you. I know that it was helpful to me the first time that I had to address these issues um, because uh, I was buying digital gear, um, you know, for the first time. And, you know, as a, it was a real common question, um, you know, what am I going to record on? Okay, so I came out of the film generation, and that was pretty straightforward. You know, you, you bought film from Kodak, you loaded it in the cameras, you shot, you know, you exposed the film, and then sent it to the lab, got it developed. And when it got out of the lab, it went to the uh, editorial, who um, cut it up and conformed it into your movie edited and then conformed into your movie. So we don't have a photochemical process anymore. It's digital. So we're using consumable media, uh, reusable media. Um, and so then the question becomes, which media, what's the best kind of media, and how do I know how, what my recording times are going to be uh, on that media based on the camera or the capture system that I'm using? Okay, because your camera is going to have everything in the world to do with what your record times are going to be on your media on your physical media okay so there's no one answer that satisfies all cameras that are out there it's going to be different pretty much for every camera that you use um, but i'll show you how to calculate it it's pretty straightforward so that's what we're going to talk about today okay um, let me go to I don't think there's anything here. Um, I'm seeing 19 folks have checked in and looked at the video lecture. And I know we got about that same number uh, live uh, last week. So it sounds like there's still a few folks who haven't seen the lecture. I'm going to be grading that and stuff uh, today into tonight, probably. So if you haven't seen last week's lecture, you might want to get on the on the web and check it out before I render a grade. Okay, let me go over to my, look at all these windows he's got open. There we go. All right. Sir, I had a quick question about last night's, or excuse me, uh, last week's lecture video. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if we were there, I know you said you ran into some error, um, errors in last week's lecture video. If we were there, do you still have a roster of people who were there, or do we need to submit the assignment? It, uh, I don't know what happened, but I couldn't open the Excel file, uh, and the video uh, was corrupt. So, and I think, it, you know, I have a couple of different Zoom um, 
accounts. And I think that uh, somehow they got confused. That's why I put up uh, the lecture from my Tuesday's class. I put that up for anyone to watch who wasn't uh, present in the live session. Uh, it's the same information. I gave the same discussion. Um, just there might be different names present in the, you know, the um, attendance thumbnails. Um, and then I asked anyone who was at the live session, yes, go to the assignment and tick off that you did it um, so that I know that you were present. I did it for uh, everybody who watched the recorded video because I can track that as they, as they check in with me. Uh, but because I lost the Excel spreadsheet from Zoom, I don't know now who was at the meeting last week. So just go into the assignment, tick off uh, complete. Let me know that you were at the live, um, and then I'll I'll give you credit for it in the uh, uh, in the assignment uh, speed grader. Okay, and remember that it, this is important because the your attendance at these lectures, whether live or watching the recorded sessions, that constitutes your class attendance grade. Okay, so at the probably the halfway point of the semester, I'll go back and I'll tabulate everybody's attendance based on, you know, who, you know, who went to the meetings or who saw the recordings. And then if there's anybody who didn't, uh, you know, they'll lose points for not attending that particular session. And then you'll have uh, an up-to-date attendance grade by midterm time. Okay. Um, okay. So does that clear it up for you? Yes, sir. It does. Thank you. Great. Alrighty. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the focus of the conversation, but I want to talk to you a little bit about sensors and a little bit about um, aspect ratio, just to give you some background if you haven't thought about these things already uh, in the past. Okay, so uh, I'll cover media, recording formats a little bit, and a little bit about compression, but I don't want to get into the weeds with that. I used to, um, and I realized that you know, most folks aren't that invested in uh, knowing what compression is yet and how to manipulate it. And that could possibly be better served in cinematography too anyway. So um, I took most of it out and I'll just talk very briefly about compression at the very end. Um, and then I have a disclaimer. And this disclaimer is this. During the course of the semester, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, cameras and concepts, gear and how to apply gear to creative problems. OK, so I think cinematography is unique in that I feel like it's a really interesting blend of science and art. OK, so you got to know a little bit about the science, which involves just a teensy bit of math, which I'm terrible at. So you can trust me when I say there's not much of that. Um, and then it's got, you know, aspects of artistic value as well, okay? Uh, but we're talking about workflow, and then we're going to be talking about how you apply workflow to your own personal preferences, and those preferences we refer to as your style, okay? And so inevitably a question is going to come up, and somebody's going to say, well, why don't we just get the best possible camera uh, to do our work with? What's the best camera out there? Um, to which I respond, um, in my experience, the best camera to do uh, this kind of work is the one that you can access and use right away. So if that's, you know, a, an Arri Alexa, great. If it's a Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro, great. If it's a Canon 5D, great. If it's a uh, pocket, you know, cinema camera, great. If it's your cell phone, okay, it is what it is, right? Maybe great, maybe not so great. But if that's the only recording device you have, and you can shoot right now, if you're inspired to shoot right now, and that's the only device you have, then in that moment, it's the best camera uh, for you because it's the only one available. And that's a, you know, that's a very simple way of looking at the problem, but I think really it's the most realistic one um, because there's going to be reasons, you know, down the road for why you have access to certain kinds of gear and not others. Okay. Uh, so you might as well be pragmatic about it and say, well, this is what I had available to me. Therefore, these are, this is the equipment that I used. 
And in that way, if you ex if you accept that as your working condition, and you uh, avail yourself of the appropriate information, you know, on how to use that gear, if you understand that. Uh, piece of equipment from the point of view uh, that it's simply a tool. Uh, and as long as you understand how to use that tool, you can apply it uh, to the benefit of its best capability and then work around what it doesn't do so well. Okay. So where you'll have very few limitations, if you have access to an area Alexa package, uh, the limitations of using a big budget digital acquisition device like an area Alexa might be you need a full size camera crew to manage that device. Focus assistant, dolly and dolly grip, because when that build is going to be, you know, many, many pounds, many tens of pounds. Okay. Second AC to help with the first AC with deploying the gear. The tripods are massive. The fluid heads are massive. The camera itself is physically very large in most cases. The lenses are large. Everything's heavy, you know. Um, so the drawbacks of a camera like that, even though it doesn't have many technical drawbacks, will be logistical ones. Okay, it'll be expensive to rent, it's even more expensive to buy. Um, you're certainly not going to have one lying around that you can just sort of borrow um, because it's not that kind of asset. Um, on the other hand, a cell phone presents a, a pretty economical and accessible device that you can use to shoot your projects with but it's gonna have different kinds of limitations. Can you, do you need a full-size camera crew to work with a cell phone platform? Nope, you can do it all by yourself, but there are some problems with the cell phone platform. Namely, um, the lenses are, uh, are very rudimentary and offer very little flexibility in terms of uh, field of view. Um, in most cases, unless you, have access to and can download proprietary software uh, to control the camera in your phone. Uh, you have an automatic exposure system and an automatic uh, um, user interface where you don't have much creative control over bright skies or color saturation or frame rate or you know things of that nature. The phones are getting better, but do they present the same kind of functional and flexible platform as an Area Alexa? No, absolutely not. But if you choose that as a constraint, like Jeff Soderbergh did for uh, his recent TV series, or the folks did that made Tangerine, the feature film that was in the Academy Award uh, running a couple of years back, if you choose to use a cell phone specifically as a creative constraint, um, and then you figure out a way to work around all the shortcomings of the cell phone and play to its strengths and downplay and work around its weaknesses, you might still be able to come up with a cinematic solution uh, that's very effective, okay? Um, so the idea is any tool in the hands of a qualified user is going to be an effective device for you. And it's not, not going to matter too terribly much uh, what the specs are unless the specs play a direct role in your creative choices. And I'll talk about some of those particulars in a minute, okay? So the short answer to what's the best camera is, I don't know. We have to know what your style is, what your budget is, what your idea is. Uh, and then hopefully we'll match a tool to the project rather than saying, let's make this one device work for everything because that may not be the case, you know? Uh, it's very hard to have one device that's going to satisfy all the different types of shooting requirements that you might have. Um, so let's learn to qualify our equipment. And then if you don't have access to it, like through school, um, there's ways to access gear on the outside, like rental houses. Okay. Uh, you can buy stuff. You know, there's no rule that says you can't go out and buy an area Alexa if money's no object. Um, but if it is, like most of us are challenged in that way, um, you decide what aspects of the Alexa are the most important to you that you would want in a camera and then seek those specs in less expensive and more accessible gear. Not, not too terribly hard. Okay, so I want to talk to you really quickly about a few of these things. Sensors and aspect ratio, pixels, resolution, bits versus bytes. And then bitrate, what it is and whether it matters. 
a little bit about compression and a little bit about color, color science, okay? Just enough to sort of whet your appetite as a cinematography one student um, to maybe want to take cinematography two, but not enough to overburden you with information that um, you won't need moving forward. I think everybody can benefit from what we're going to talk about today. Okay, we'll start with aspect ratio. So here's Ray Fiennes. Um, he was in Grand Budapest Hotel a couple of years back. Um, super sweet guy. I worked with him a couple of times. Really nice guy. Um, and so I think of him, he's Mr. Gustav. I, you know, I think of uh, him every time somebody mentions Grand Budapest Hotel. I thought he did a great job with that. But an interesting thing about Grand Budapest Hotel, has everybody here seen that movie? If you haven't seen it, you might want to check it out. So it's Wes Anderson. It's the director. Um, it's called the Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, it's got a kind of an ensemble cast. Uh, Adrian Brody, uh, F. Murray, Murray Abraham, uh, Sorsha Ronan, um, De, uh, Willem Dafoe. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people in this movie. Um, but one of the interesting things about it is, is uh, Wes Anderson changes the aspect ratio of the movie uh, for the viewer. So the audience, uh, in many cases, you don't even realize that when it's happening, the aspect ratio of the film will change from uh, a letterboxed widescreen uh, format to uh, a full screen 185 cinematic presentation and then to a vertically letterboxed 137, um, what we used to call TV safe uh, format. Um, based on what's happening at that moment in the story. And then he, he did it in, in interviews that he's given since the movie came out. Um, he has responded specifically to the question of why did you do that in your movie? Uh, and his answer was basically that it was, um, uh, he was paying tribute to sort of the history of cinema and the idea that our presentation aspect ratio the shape that we associate with our screens, our, our viewing experience, uh, that proportion has changed over time. And so if we look at this simple graphic representation here, um, you can see that um, I have three sort of preview areas colored in different grayscales here. Uh, in the center, we have the one, three, three, um, 133 was the television aspect ratio of standard definition TV that was prevalent from the 50s until uh, the mid to late 90s. Um, and 1.37 is the original cinema presentation aspect ratio. Uh, when you went to the movie theater in the 20s and 30s and 40s, um, or 20s and 30s anyway, um, the native proportion of the uh, theater screen was 1.37 to one. It was a ratio, okay? Uh, later when television came out, television uh, was designed to compete directly with the theater experience uh, and pull or coax uh, uh, patrons away from the theater uh, industry and into the living room where they could watch movies and programs on their TV in the comfort of their own home, not have to get in the car, not have to drive into town and go to the theater and buy tickets and then buy expensive, you know, drinks and popcorn and stuff and then sit down with a crowd of people and try to watch a movie. The whole idea with TV was you could do it in your own living room. And so they chose an aspect ratio that was really close to what people would see on the theater screens if they went to their local uh, cinema. And uh, that's where we got the original TV aspect ratio from, which is gray right here. The contemporary motion picture aspect ratio is 185 to 1. That's the next gray square out in between the light gray and the black. So 185 to 1 is the next size aspect ratio. And that's most of your theatrical screens now uh, that you go and look at uh, at your local theater. Uh, 185 to 1 is uh, the result of uh, a length by width measurement of the screen that results in a 185 to 1 uh, proportion. 
uh, 185 to 1 is more of a rectangle than 133 or 137, uh, you can see that this aspect ratio is almost completely square, okay? And it's born out of the 4 to 3 uh, aspect ratio, okay, or 4 to 3 proportion, which is a photographic, believe it or not, a still photographic proportion, or an anamorphic proportion for, an uns for a squeezed anamorphic image that hasn't been unsqueezed through projection. Uh, and that's a detail I can talk about uh, with you guys later. 185 is the regular normal eye perspective theatrical uh, proportion for a movie screen. And then 235 is the widescreen film equivalent of your sort of um, uh, not Vista Vision, but your Ultra Vision or your CinemaScope presentation at the movie theater your widescreen, your super widescreen experience, okay? Um, and it almost looks like two 137s bumped together, doesn't it? Which is kind of, you know, essentially what's happening there. It's just double wide from the original 137 aspect ratio. And this aspect ratio, 235 to 1, uh, was a product of research that was done in the 50s uh, because when televisions came out and they started competing with folks going to the movie theaters, uh, movie theaters started losing a lot of money. Um, and as a direct result of that, the studios were losing money because fewer theaters wanted to rent their release prints for um, shorter periods of time because they didn't have the audience because everybody was staying home and watching television. So they had to think of a new way to get people out back into the theaters uh, and away from their television sets. And so the widescreen uh, CinemaScope or you know, ultra vision uh, widescreen experience was concocted by the studios as a sort of a gimmick, kind of like 3D was a gimmick for a long time, a, a gimmick to get people back into the theaters to watch projected content again. Uh, and it worked for a very long time. Um, through the 60s and 70s, television sort of ran concurrently with theatrical content and the two industries started moving further and further apart, television kind of evolving into what it was and theatrical evolving into what it was. And each of them had different presentation rectangles, different size screens that people were looking at. Okay, the theatrical experience was the, the wide or wider rectangle and the TV experience was the nearly square uh, screen surface that we were looking at at home. Here's a quick video about aspect ratio and whether or not it should play any, you know, consideration in your process of deciding how you want to present your, your content to your audience. And now our feature presentation, Lawrence of Arabia, presented in its original Ultra Cinemascope letterbox format. Well, I can't see anything. Who's the rather attractive girl on the camel? That's Peter O'Toole. You I want to make a quick video on the usage of aspect ratios as a thematic device in film. While the first 40 years of film were limited to one ratio for length and width of a screen, modern filmmakers have several aspect ratios to choose from, and each one can have a different emotional effect for the viewer. Let's look at why filmmakers choose the ratios they choose and explore the emotional effect of changing aspect ratio during a film. The oldest aspect ratio is the 4 by 3 Academy ratio, and it lost its popularity after the introduction of 16 by 9 ratio in the 1950s. Directors still use this ratio sometimes, though, to make the film feel like it's from an older time period. A great example is the Grand Budapest Hotel, which switches to Academy when the story goes back to the 1940s. It begins, of course, with... The aspect ratio change is a great way to emotionally transport us to the time period when this ratio was popular. We associate the aspect ratio with old-timey movies, and it helps pull us into the old-timey style, quirkiness, manners, and culture that the Grand Budapest Hotel has. 500 Days of Summer uses Polaroid square ratio as a way to show a glamorized, reminiscent past. This time capsule look coincides nicely with Tom's old-fashioned, unrealistic view of love. Towards the end of the movie, though, this Polaroid look is eventually pushed off screen as Tom realizes the expectation of this old-fashioned outlook does not coincide with reality.
2.35 ratio is ultra widescreen and it gives the look of an epic big budget drama or a sci-fi film. I like how Auntie Donna uses it for over the top drama. Mark thinks he's so good, but compared to you, he's such doodles of robot games. I mean, he is the app. The ratio is reserved for extremely epic movies. A movie like Napoleon Dynamite would look kind of off in this extreme ratio, but a movie like Star Wars wouldn't look nearly the same without it. Portraying space is commonly associated with big aspect ratio changes. Interstellar switches to IMAX footage when the shots are of space and goes back to 16 by nine for shots of the spaceship. What better way to make space look bigger than by literally adding to the screen? The same is done in Apollo 13 and Galaxy Quest to show the huge scope of space. Aspect ratio changes to add scope aren't exclusive to space movies, though. Right before the Bane vs. Batman fight in The Dark Knight Rises, for example, the camera transitions to bigger IMAX footage. This change has a great subconscious emotional effect. It reminds us subtly that we're about to watch an intense, epic scene. Hunger Games also does a good job of adding anticipation by slowly expanding into IMAX footage before the fighting begins. The right aspect ratio can contribute to the realism of a film. A scripted film that's supposed to look like a documentary has to be 16 by 9 or else it won't emotionally feel like a documentary. The opening scene in The Incredibles purposefully looks like 16 millimeter 6x9 ratio film, and the effect adds realism, so the movie feels less like a cartoon and more like a realistic action film. Catch Me If You Can cleverly uses aspect ratio change to show Frank is contained. He starts on TV in the small academy ratio, and then he's next shown through a small slit in a wall. He is literally being squished in the frame. It gives the emotional feeling that Frank is trapped. The most ambitious aspect ratio changes are when the ratio is ignored completely. Life of Pi has the fish literally jumping out of the frame. And Oz the Great and Powerful does the same with a burst of flame. It's a really immersive technique and makes for a great visual. Aspect ratios have a chance to greatly contribute to the visual storytelling of the film. Whether they indicate time period, intensity, or added realism, aspect ratios are another clever tool at the disposal of the modern director. If you want to fully understand the style of a film, the film's aspect ratio is a great frame of reference. Thanks for watching. Okay, so... <clears throat> He mixes his metaphors a little bit in this presentation. Um, if you're listening really closely, for instance, he talks about um, 185 aspect ratio uh, when they're sh he's showing uh, 235 aspect ratio inside the spaceship, and he's talking about 235 being outside, showing you know pictures of the universe and the planets and stuff. Um, and then he refers to six by nine uh, aspect ratio which is purely a photographic aspect ratio. Um, so it's not a cinematic aspect ratio uh, to my mind. Um, so he mixes some of those metaphors up a little bit. And he also kind of talks a lot about 4.3 and 16 by nine interchangeably. And he talked really quickly about it as if you all kind of are already up to speed on that aspect. So I'll ask you this question now. Um, does anybody know what the aspect ratio of the tel of your television set is at home? Or the aspect ratio of your laptop screen, if you have a 15 or 16 inch Apple laptop, for instance? 16 by 9. Okay. The aspect ratio of, of a television set used to be from the 4 to 3 standard, length by width, 4 units by 3 units. Uh, proportionately speaking, when you divide uh, uh, three into four, you get one point uh, eight five. Well, you get one point. Yeah, you get one point eight five, I believe. Um, so a TV, you know, with a twenty-five inch diagonal, might have had, you know, a frame that was eighteen inches high by twenty-three inches wide. Okay, almost square, and then the diagonal. Um, was how you bought your television set, 25 inch, 19 inch, uh, 46 inch, I believe was one of the choices. Uh, and it was a cathode ray tube. So it was a big glass TV screen, right? Um, but when we went to the high definition standard from standard definition, which was essentially a doubling of the line resolution of a television broadcast, the television screens were then, the aspect ratio changed to 16 by nine. Okay, which was quite a bit, you know, longer in width by multiplied by the height. 
Okay, so your television, which appears to be, you know, it's a longer rectangle than your grandparents' old cathode ray tube that they might still have. Um, the reason is because the old cathode television sets only showed us 640 by 480. So 480 lines high by 640 lines across. That was the total resolution of the screen. Uh, and now we have 1920 by 1080 high. So 1080 high, 1920 wide, okay? As far as our, our pixel ratio, okay? That's what they call it, or your, or your line uh, resolution, okay? So it's essentially four times as big as standard definition, right? Very nearly. Uh, and then interestingly enough, ultra high definition 4K is four times the size of HD. So we're, we're sort of, you know, quadrupling our, our pixel aspect ratio and uh, the size of our screen as we go up in terms of total resolution of our video files. Okay, but we're now ever since full HD from, from here on out, the native aspect ratio of our presentation screens will be the wider rectangle uh, in the 16 by nine aspect ratio, okay? It's very close to the theatrical uh, 185. 16 by nine is uh, 178 to one. Theatrical presentation is 185 to one. So if you see ultra high definition, uh, 3860 by uh, 3840 by 2160 pixel resolution, um, which is 16 by nine, okay? Um, you get a, a proportion, a native proportion of 178 to one. Theatrical is 185 to one. So it's just a little bit wider. The rectangle is just a teensy bit wider than the television rectangle, but they almost fit perfectly uh, one in the other, right? So now if you're shooting film stock uh, for um, theatrical release and you, you're counting on it being on TV at some point in time, um, they're not gonna do what we call panning and scanning of your image to make your theatrical image fit into a narrower rectangle for TV. It's pretty much going to fit nearly exactly. And what you'll see is a very, very small representation. Here's what it's all about. Uh, a black striping of the image from 185 going into, going into 16 by 9. There'll be a very, very thin black line on the top and bottom of the frame. Anybody know what that's called? Anyone take, take a stab at it? It's called letterboxing. Okay. They used to have to do it a lot in the old days. Like when I was a kid, uh, when they finally got around to showing Star Wars on TV, they had to letterbox it. Here's a four by three aspect ratio screen, like what standard definition would have had over here in this corner, right? Uh, but Star Wars was shot two, three, five to one, right? It was a theatrical ultra wide presentation. So in order to get the entire frame onto the TV screen without panning and scanning, they had to reduce the size of the frame so it would fit left and right. And then they had to put letterboxing on the top and bottom so that um, you weren't distracted by the lack of signal it would have been snow on the top and the bottom in these spaces if they didn't put the letterboxing in there. And then you could watch Star Wars full frame on your 4.3 television set. Um, panning and scanning, what that would do would be it would take this ultra wide uh, frame and blow it up from the center so it fit on the four by three proportion screen. And then if there was any detail or action at the very extreme right and left of the frame that they wanted you to see in the broadcast, they would actually have to pan and scan the image when they converted it from film to digital to, to video. And they would actually pan over and show you what's happening in the extreme right and left of the frame. If any of you have seen a, an old video copy of like, for instance, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, uh, in, the, in the climactic scene when Clint is uh, gonna draw, uh, he's gonna swap iron with, um, what's his name, with Tuco uh, for the name of the guy where the gold is buried in the cemetery. Well, the, in the theatrical presentation, the cinematographer composed it so those guys were on the extreme right and left of frame, right? And he was using the ultra widescreen 
uh, presentation format compositionally to show you the distance between these two guys and how they were going to shoot at each other. And the guy who survived the gunfight got the gold that, that was buried in the in the cemetery. But in the television version, if your local broadcaster didn't pan and scan the, the copy, uh, that scene, there was nobody in it. <laughs> it was a scene of the cemetery in the background and the circular area of stones where the guys are standing. But Clint and um, um, Eli Wallach are outside of the television safe frame in the cinematic frame and you don't see them. And some broadcasters panned and scanned it so that it would pan over and show you Clint and then it would pan over and show you Eli Wallach and then it would pan back again and back again and then they would draw and they had to manipulate that uh, presentation for television so that the cinematic version would play well on the television screen. Okay, that was the problem with showing theatrical aspect ratio on an old standard definition television set. It, they didn't fit. The rectangles were different sizes. Okay, so panning and scanning is a big problem. It adds cost to uh, broadcast. Uh, and it takes away from the original compositional intent of the director or the cinematographer um, when you change their rectangle, right? So that's one of the reasons why in, in high definition, they went to a 16 by 9 standard, because that's what would fit uh, within the, with the pixel capability of of HD for broadcast, which was a maximum of 3840, not, um, not uh, 4096, which is the maximum pixel ratio uh, lengthwise of a, a piece of motion picture film. So, but it's pretty darn close in other words. So uh, the television screen you have in your house now, if you show a theatrical version of something on your TV screen at home, you're gonna miss maybe 5% of the detail and it's probably inconsequential because modern filmmakers now understand that they can shoot up to a very thin stripe on either side of the frame and have everything be what we call television safe. In other words, all the information that's within that compositional frame in the cinema camera will also be in the uh, television frame uh, by virtue of a simple crop guide or something in the viewfinder to let them know where TV safe, the TV safe zone is, okay? Um, so the presentation screen is what this whole discussion of aspect ratio is really about. Uh, it has very little to do with anything else technically or otherwise, um, except that it can be a compositional choice. Once upon a time, uh, in the television era where we were standard deaf and cathode ray tubes, if you were shooting widescreen or rectangular content, you were probably, your intention was probably to have your material screened at theaters and you weren't really concerned if your content appeared on TV or not. Um, and then if you were shooting for television, you shot, you had a tendency to shoot everything in a, in a squarer uh, format so that no detail would be lost in your compositions when that uh, content was uh, scanned and shown on a television monitor. Okay, so it, it was two different ways of thinking about presentation at that point. But now televisions and theater screens pretty much have the same aspect ratio, unless you're shooting UltraVision or you're shooting CinemaScope today, uh, and you can do that digitally. Uh, if you want the 235 or the digital 239 representation of ultra wide screen, uh, you'll get letterboxing on your 16 by 9 TV to accommodate the yet wider rectangle of the CinemaScope. And you can see that in this uh, center pr uh, monitor pr uh, presentation right here. So the 21 by nine relationship has a very thin letterbox on top and bottom, if you so choose. And it's an interesting look. Uh, some commercials are shot that way for impact, for dramatic impact. Um, sometimes the wide rectangle compositionally offers some really interesting choices that you can make in terms of how the audience will perceive your images, um, which uh, can add some emotional value or some emotional impact to your story. So it's an interesting choice to consider, but it's usually uh, an aesthetic one and it's very rarely a technical one. Anamorphic lenses, you're gonna hear people talk about anamorphics every once in a while when they talk about cinematography. Anamorphics um, was the science that was developed in the 50s to make uh, normal 185 projections become 235 projections in the theater. 
okay? And it was done by special lenses that were on the motion picture cameras at the moment of capture, right? When they were shooting the movie and then another special lens that had to be projected through when they projected that movie on the film screen, okay? And if you looked at the film stock that came out of the camera through the anamorphic lenses, everything would be very narrow and squeezed very high top and bottom in the proportions of a standard television set, ironically, 4-3 aspect ratio. But, you know, a guy standing on, you know, on the left or right one third of the frame would look really stretched and tall and skinny because he was shot through an anamorphic optic, okay? And then the projection optic would squeeze that image back down to normal proportion so that the six foot tall character would look like a normally proportioned man walking through a wide two, three, five frame. So that's what those terms are referring to when you hear squeezed, unsqueezed, and anamorphic. Okay, that was an actual optical process. Um, and now folks somehow associate anamorphic with superior cinematic quality. And that's really not the case. Okay, it's, it's simply referring to a vestigial process that uh, we used to use as a fairly common solution to interesting widescreen projection content for theaters to compete with really, really interesting TV content that people were staying home to watch instead of going out and paying, you know, whatever the cost of a ticket was in those days uh, to go to the theater. So it really had more to do with marketing than anything else. But if you look at, I, I, I stress looking at Grand Budapest Hotel, if you haven't seen it, A, it's, I think, a funny movie. It's Wes Anderson. I, I love his sense of humor anyway. Um, but he uses the traditional aspect ratio for, you know, the generic action or the, you know, the, 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 the standard storytelling. Um, and he uses the compositional advantages of 16 by nine uh, to give you these interesting frames. Like this is towards the end of the movie, I think when they're going in and trying to um, free Mr. Gustav, I think it is, because uh, he's been imprisoned for being a crooked hotel, uh, <laughs> hotel curator. Um, and you can see here in this frame, this 185 frame, uh, they're using the composition of the guards and his fellow inmates with Mr. Gustav right in the middle, centered in the frame, to give you these interesting leading lines, these, these lines that run to a vanishing point on the horizon that all lead you, <clears throat> that all lead you compositionally, excuse me, to Mr. Gustav right here in the middle of the frame. So you can see the lines of the railing, the lines of the guards, the lines of the prisoners, all their heads are all leading to Mr. Gustav. Even the lines of the table as they converge towards the background are leading you towards Mr. Gustav, who's right in the middle of the frame. So this is, you know, this is one manipulation of a 185 aspect ratio uh, in terms of composition. When he wants to pay tribute to the cinema of the 40s, he gives you the four to three aspect ratio. Uh, and so some of the scenes in the movie are showing you this sort of proportion in the frame, right? Which is closer to the television aspect ratio, okay? And if you were to see that with the vertical letterboxing in place, uh, you would have seen in the theatrical release, you would have seen these black letterboxes on right and left of frame when he went to the 137 uh, tribute aspect ratio. And then when he's in the wide ultra ultra <clears throat> ultra vision uh, two three two three nine digitally uh, two three five uh, photochemically, uh, he's showing you something that plays better in the extremely wide rectangle. And in this case, it's the interiors of the hotel itself. So he's treating in these really wide rectangular frames. He's treating the hotel almost like a character by composing for the hotel backdrop uh, within a much wider frame that is accommodating of these interesting wide details like the dining room uh, where Zero as an old man uh, retells his story of how he inherited the hotel to the, uh, to the newspaper writer. And here's a single on uh, Mr. Gustav across the table from the reporter and it's still in the 239 aspect ratio because he's using the doors and the crown molding of the room, which is just another angle on this room. 
all those details are against this wall. Here's here's zero sitting right here. So this wall and this crown molding and this balcony are forming the details that are now in the background of his close up. So the doors are a compositional element. The moldings are composi compositional element. Okay, even the lights on the wall, they're all elements. And then he's centered right in the middle of the frame, which is another kind of classic Wes Anderson uh, aesthetic choice. You notice how he also centered Mr. Gustav in Mr. Gustav's close-ups in the prison, right? He'll do that with his characters a lot to create emphasis. Uh, and then he uses these wide backgrounds, these static backgrounds for compositional effect. So that's all I really want to mention to you about aspect ratio. Just understand that it's a choice. Uh, a lot of times it can be um, executed mechanically using special optics. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of changing the aspect ratio in the camera you're using. Uh, some cameras, like for instance, um, I've got a GH5 shooting me right now. A GH4, you can go into the menu system of a of a Lumix GH4 or GH5, and it'll ask you what what proportion you want to shoot in. It'll ask you if you want to shoot DCI 4K. That's digital cinema 4K. And that's 4096 by 2160. Ultra high definition 4K, which is broadcast 4K, is 3840 by 2160. So it's a little bit narrower. It's still basically the same kind of rectangle, but it's just a hair narrower than uh, the digital cinema uh, standard, which is 4096. Okay. Um, and so you can pick what aspect ratio you want to shoot with, and it will just take that proportion out of the uh, out of the capture device inside your camera off of the sensor. Okay. So you can see here, this is a sensor from a GH5. It's what we call a micro four third sens uh, sensor. Uh, and that's by virtue of its size. So the size of the sensor is something like, uh, I think it's 19.3 by 17.9 millimeters. Okay. And that aspect ratio is pretty close to four to three, pretty close to one, three, seven. Uh, and the reason why is because that micro four third sensor in the GH5 can accept mechanical anamorphic squeezed lenses and it converts digitally the squeezing. It unsqueezes the image for you in a presentation proxy that you can watch on a monitor and then in a proxy uh, metadata that you can poof, open up in, for instance, Premiere and unsqueeze that image in Premiere and get that really wide rectangle uh, by using an anamorphic lens on a Panasonic GH5. It's a really kind of a boutique capability for something like a GH5, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's something you can do with one of these cameras, which is kind of interesting. Other cameras on the market uh, do it, they do it digitally, okay? In other words, they'll extract digitally a wider uh, rectangle from the capture device's pixel field. And in doing so, uh, just like with a letterbox on a TV screen, how you end up blocking away or cropping away certain portions of the frame, uh, digitally, when you shoot digital anamorphic with any other capture device, you're not using some of the pixel count uh, on those parts of the chip where your ultra wide uh, format does not reside and you end up with a lower resolution video file. So it's interesting when you can use the full chip and shoot with an anamorphic lens, a fully squeezed and crunched anamorphic file that you can then open up and de-squeeze in post-production. Your resolution is that much higher. Uh, so it's an interesting capability of the GH5 that in, you know, in a $2,000 camera that you can do that. Um, some of the other cameras that allow you to do that, for instance, the Area Alexa does it, obviously. Um, but that, you know, that camera is out of the price range of most of us, uh, body only at $48,000. So uh, it's interesting that a little sub $2,000 camera will do something that only a professional studio camera will do. Okay, so your image sensor will have a native aspect ratio, just like uh, your TV screen or your presentation screen. Um, and you have to consider what that is. A lot of these sensors now have a 16 by nine standard that they produce. And then you have to choose an alternate aspect ratio in a menu somewhere like in the GH5, normally it will shoot 16 by nine unless you go into the menus and tell it 
to shoot anamorphic 4.3 and then it will give you that squeezed image. Okay, but ordinarily it's 16 by 9 ratio. And if you look at the sensors in a lot of these cameras, you'll see that they all pretty much look like rectangles uh, that are associated with the 185 shape. Okay. But you have all these different um, proportions uh, present in cameras, for instance. Um, two, two to three is a photographic aspect ratio. It's the same proportion that an eight by 10 photograph is. So if you're a photographer and you shoot magazine covers or you shoot um, images for magazines, you might want a camera that has a native aspect ratio and a chip that has a native proportion of two to three, because that's the same as eight by 10, which is the same as a uh, full page uh, uh, with bleed uh, magazine photograph. Okay. Um, so different proportions and aspect ratios for different end products, right? And that's why I like to, instead of saying 16 by nine is your TV screen, I call it your presentation screen because a, mag a page in a magazine can also be considered a presentation screen. All it is is, you know, a presentation of an image that you're looking at and what is that shape? And is it vertical or horizontal, right? So uh, four by three also fits uh, within, uh, within the aspect of a uh, photographed full page uh, in a magazine. It's a little bit wider though. It's eight and a half by 11, okay? 17 by nine is what you get when you um, divide uh, the pixel proportion of your ultra high definition television. So the movie screen is 185 to one or, or uh, I'm sorry, or, or 17 by nine. And then your TV is 16 by nine. That's, that's what I wanted to say. 185 in the theater equals 17 by nine. 16 by nine in the television equals your ultra high definition, 3840 by 2160. And 21 by nine is your widescreen uh, proportion. You can also think of it this way. Three to two is equivalent to 1.5 to one. Four to three is equivalent to 133 to one. 16 by nine is equivalent to 1.78 to one. 17 by nine is equivalent to 185 to one. 21 by nine is equivalent to 233 to one, okay? And then we just usually use the proportion as a reference. 133, we think about the TV square. 178, we think of the current HD television rectangle. 185 is the theatrical rectangle and 233, 235, 239 is the ultra wide theatrical rectangle. Okay, so if you just kind of think of it in that shorthand, it'll give you a sense of what these different proportions are doing. Okay. Anybody confused by that at this point? Is it sounding just like a lot of Greek or is it making somewhat sort of making sense? Isn't the length supposed to be divided by the height or? Uh, well, no, if you took 16 by nine, 16 is the length and nine is the height. There's 1.789s in 16, so it's 16 divided by 9. Does that make sense? Okay. The, the wider number is always going to be the length of the frame. Just think about it that way. The smaller number is the height, and the height's always going to be shorter than the length. Even with the old-time TVs, the length was just slightly wider than the height. Okay. So the longer number is always the maximum width of the frame. <clears throat> Okay, how does sensor size affect photography and cinematography? This is uh, Wolf Crow, and sometimes he can get a little uh, deep in the weeds. So if you want to know how sensor size can affect your photography, check out the video. I put it in web courses, and you can watch it there under videos for the week. Uh, plus, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's a little bit of a tangent. I just want you to think about Screens and chips, right? So this is your chip or your capture device has is a rectangle. What shape is that rectangle? How much of that rectangle is being used? How many of those pixels are being used to create the image? And what proportion or ratio are they in, right? Uh, 3840 by 2160, 4096 by 2160, 1920 by 1080, right? HD, Ultra HD, DCI 4K, right? 
and then 6k is even more and 8k is even more right but they're all rectangles some of them are a little bit smaller than others okay but they all have the same kind of native proportion and we can get all the same aspect ratios out of these either optically or digitally and if you look at uh, an image with the sort of representations of the different uh, sizes of sensors that you can get in these cameras. So this is a sensor, right? So this is an APS-C sensor. This is what you would see if you looked down the throat of your uh, uh, EOS 7D, or if you had a, uh, like you guys have 60Ds at school. So if you were to take the lens off the camera and look in at the 60D, let's if I can get some light on it here. You can kind of see the chip in there, right? It's basically the guy on the left. Uh, the one on the right is a, what we call a full frame sensor. It has a different dimension, um, 24 by 36 millimeters. That's the size of the uh, image sensor you can expect to see in a Canon 5D or in a uh, Sony C700 or in a Sony Venice, a Canon C700 or a Sony Venice or in a Sony a7S III, uh, you're gonna see uh, a sensor that's quite large inside what we call the port of your camera where the lens attaches, okay? And so just think about them and their relative size. So if both of these, here's a concept that's coming up, right? In a couple of frames. If both of these sensors represent the same resolution, right? then there's gonna be something about these sensors that we're gonna to need to think about perhaps uh, when we're talking about the effectiveness of one sensor over the other, okay? And the answer to that is what we call photosites and I'll tell you what those are next, okay? But just understand that both of these sensors are capable of producing native DCI 4K resolution, but one of them looks like it's almost twice the size of the other, okay? That means that the photosites, the photosensitive areas on the chip are different sizes on this camera than they are on this one. Okay, and then they and then they compare proportionately. Uh, if you could superimpose a reference rendering of what, say, the APS-C sensor looks like and compared with the full frame sensor, you see that this very outer orange band right here showing you the maximum image area, that's what the full frame sensor allegedly would see uh, in contrast to the next orange band, which is showing you what, what we call a center punched image, right? In other words, this rectangle has been punched right out of the center of the larger one, okay? And that's the native image area of the APS-C size sensor and I see uh, in a Canon 7D, for instance, or a 60D uh, video DSLR. Uh, the next square in is green and it's uh, referred to as M MFT, micro four thirds, okay? That's the size of the sensor image area that you get out of a uh, Panasonic GH4, GH5, okay? Uh, the next size in, the next size green square in, the next smaller size, that's a one inch sensor. Uh, and you'll get that in uh, like the JVC or the Sony uh, handheld video cameras that uh, your mom and dad, you pull out at birthday time. and at holiday time to shoot uh, the kids running around the yard, right? The one inch uh, video sensor. Uh, the, the aqua colored square right here is the broadcast sensor size, two thirds of an inch. And that size chip in triplicate is what's inside a broadcast television camera, like the ones for instance, that record the football game live to television. Okay, through a beam splitter, there'll be three chips inside a broadcast video camera, uh, each one tuned to red, blue, or green color saturation. And all three chips together uh, create the image and you layer those images on top of one another, mix the red, blue, and green standards to get all the different colors of the broadcast color spectrum uh, using three separate chips. That's a little bit like if some of you, if you're history buffs or film aficionados, that might sound a little bit like the Technicolor process. And well, Technicolor process is a film-based photochemical process. Uh, it's very similar in that it used three strips of film and a beam splitter to shoot three different color sensitive layers that were 
sandwiched together to create the full color spectrum in high resolution. That was the whole principle behind the three chip video cameras for broadcast. They could have triple the uh, image clarity and, and color saturation if each chip was tuned to one of the three uh, video primaries, red, blue, and green, right? One half by 2.3, uh, that's, uh, that's a pretty small chip. That's in a handy cam. And then the very smallest blue uh, device in the middle, the one by 3.2 inch, that is most of the time the size of the sensor that's in your cell phone, for instance. So you can see how much smaller the image area is. And this is by pixel count or by um, point of view. In other words, the lens on the camera, if it stayed the same with each of these cameras in terms of how what the focal length was, uh, but you simply changed camera to change sensor size, what that sensor saw out of the whole projection of that 50 millimeter lens would be a smaller and smaller portion of the actual image. Does that make any sense to you guys? It's kind of a weird concept. If you think of a lens, like here's a, here's a uh, cinema lens, for instance, right? And if I open the iris all the way and you look through, see if I can get give me a white surface here, something white to put behind it. Um, well, how about my shirt? I don't know. I don't know if you can see um, through the lens, okay? Um, but uh, can I show you this and my presentation at the same time? Let's see. I don't know if I can. Yeah. Well, can you see me okay in the small thumbnail? Think of this as a, as a mini projector, okay? If I were to take a flashlight, right, and shine it through this lens, I could project it on a wall and you'd see the light from the flashlight passing through the lens and projecting in a circle on the wall, okay? And based on how far that lens is away from the image sensor, that circle will get bigger or smaller, right? Just the way the circle would get bigger or smaller if I pulled that lens further away from the wall or pushed it closer to the wall while I'm shining the flashlight through it. This is just a projector. So light goes through the front of the cinema lens, comes out the back, passing through the iris, which is a hole that gets wider and smaller, depending on how we set it for our exposure. And it projects an image circle over the top of your sensor, over the top of this thing sitting in the middle of your camera, right? And so the idea is you want to shoot with a lens that projects an image circle that just barely covers the size sensor you're working with. So a 50 millimeter lens on a Canon 5D will cover corner to corner this entire sensor. The image circle through the lens covers the whole sensor. But if you put that same 50 millimeter lens on this Canon 7D with a smaller sensor, some of the image that's projected through the lens is, is gonna be discarded. It's not gonna be recorded on the chip. Does that make sense? So that's what this representation is trying to show you here, is that the projection that is big enough and wide enough to cover this largest rectangle, if you're shooting on a small sensor, like with your cell phone, you're only gonna actually get this much of the image out of the same size lens. So what that should tell you is, different size sensors might need different lenses to show you an equivalent point of view based on the size of your sensor and the focal length of the lens you've chosen. So it, it can get complicated. I don't want to get any deeper than that with you right now, um, because basically the gear that we have for you guys at school, it's all kind of matched. So you don't have to worry about these things too much. Um, but you'll, you'll hear people on YouTube talk about um, uh, reproduction ratio, or they'll talk about um, uh, they'll talk about um, uh, magnification factor, right? And they'll say, oh, uh, you know, uh, a 50 millimeter lens on a Canon 5D is a one to one reproduction ratio. But if you put the same 50 millimeter lens on a, on a, a Panasonic uh, Lumix GH5, uh, it's a 2x uh, multiplication factor. 
So the 50 millimeter lens is effectively a 100 millimeter lens on the GH5. And that has to do with this right here. In other words, if this was a 50 millimeter lens on this biggest full frame rectangle right here, and you were to use a micro four thirds chip like the GH5, which is right here, if you were to look at the projection of a 100 millimeter lens for this size frame, um, the image area in here would look very similar to what you got with a 100 millimeter lens on the on the 5D. Okay, because the chip on the Panasonic camera is half the size. It's less than half the size. Okay, so the <clears throat> the point of view of the lens, the magnification of the lens will change depending on what size sensor is in your camera. That's all I want you to really understand. But it's hard to just say that without sort of explaining the why of it, right? <clears throat> so on a Canon 5D, if I chose a 50 millimeter lens on a Canon 5D and I shot this, this young lady, right, in her close up, if I wanted to get the same size close up with the same information in the frame, and I used a GH5, I would have to use a 25 millimeter lens on a GH5 to get the same angle of view or point of view through the lens, okay? In other words, if the sensor in the GH5 is half the size of the sensor in the 5D, then logic would dictate a 50 millimeter lens on a 5D becomes a 25 millimeter lens on a GH5. Does that make sense? Okay. Then we can skip this graphic, which is basically the same thing as this one. It all has to do with what we used to do on film stock. Okay, so everything that the digital generation is trying to accomplish is essentially explaining away with technology and duplicating what we did with film and film cameras in the old days. Okay, or what Christopher Nolan still does with film cameras today which is there were different aspect ratios we could extract from a film negative, either a 185 using a certain amount of the cinematic frame with between the perfs of a piece of film. Okay, we could shoot what we call the Academy 137 aspect ratio, the DCI 185 aspect ratio, or we could even shoot an even smaller square in here, which was what we called the TV pumpkin or the TV safe zone inside this green dotted line right here. All right, and all our compositions had to reside within that green dotted rectangular or we would have information outside of the TV screen that was recorded on the film stock, right? So we needed to have a ground glass inside the film camera that showed us where the TV screen was gonna crop away the image that we saw through the viewfinder and that ignore anything outside of the TV safe bubble because it wouldn't show up on the TV screen. We could have all these different aspect ratios within this, the film stock, depending on how the camera was constructed and the, and the way the beam splitter was constructed and the lenses that you're using. Digital now can do the same things electronically and with uh, CPUs as opposed to optics and film stock. If you were to look at all the different types of cameras you guys have available to you at UCF, uh, you have most of the cameras in this little presentation. You don't have any Sony A7Ss or any Canon C100s, um, but you have Ursa Minis, you have 5Ds. Uh, you were supposed to get pocket cinema cameras and GH5s maybe next year. <clears throat> you also have, uh, you have a 7D, you have several 60Ds, which is basically the same camera. Uh, you have several Blackmagic Pocket, the original Blackmagic Pocket cameras, which is only full HD. Uh, the new one is 4K or 6K. The old one is HD only. Uh, and then I have a picture here for reference of a cell phone uh, capture device. Um, notice how the capture device inside the Pocket, the original Pocket Cinema camera um, it looks kind of like the sensor in the 7D or the sensor in the Lumix GH5, but it's kind of two different colors. It's got a darker blue-green and a lighter blue-green. The lighter blue-green is what we call the active image area on that sensor. So the sensor in the pocket cinema camera, the original one, uh, only used two-thirds of the actual 
uh, capability of that sensor in that camera. And the equivalent film uh, format to the original pocket cinema camera was what we called super 16 millimeter, which was cinematic 16 millimeter uh, film. So um, this camera has a very interesting look. If you, if you check out um, from UCF, if you check out one of their cameras, I think they got eight of these um, and some lenses. They have lenses to fit on it uh, and go out and shoot some video with it. It'll be 1920 by 1080, uh, which is certainly good for YouTube. It's certainly good for anything you're going to put on the internet, right? Because the internet is HD or smaller resolution, right? Uh, if you take some uh, images with this, shoot some video and take a look at it, it should have sort of an antique or uh, nostalgic feel to it. Um, I think the video that comes out of these little cameras looks a lot like film. Uh, it reminds me, uh, I have a couple of these, um, the uh, pocket, the original pocket cinema camera. And uh, the video that comes out of these cameras reminds me a lot of what 16 millimeter film used to look like out of a film camera. So it's kind of neat to have a digital device that can record images with that kind of um, vintage aesthetic. Uh, so if you were shooting a, a video that you wanted to treat as like a, um, uh, a period piece, for instance, you might consider shooting it on the original pocket cinema camera, even though your images would only be HD, they would have a sort of color cast and a patina that would remind you a lot of what film looked like in the old days, quote unquote, uh, which could be something it's rather than trying to figure out how to uh, arrive at that look in post-production and spending a lot of time and money uh, trying to figure out the right color correction process to use to, to tweak your video, it's going to come out that way automatically out of a camera like this because it's designed uh, to look like 16 millimeter film from the get-go. That was one of the neat things about this camera, which is why I still have them, um, because they'll render an image out of this camera in full HD that is very vintage looking and might be very costly uh, or at least technically very complicated to achieve uh, in a GH5 or in a, or in a black magic cinema camera, for instance, that has different color rendering capabilities and characteristics. Okay. So some of this now is going to start, it's going to start sounding artistic, right? Like there's some artistic choices we can make and that, and that would be somewhat true within the greater, realm of the technology we're talking about. But let's think about that sensor. Uh, now let's think about it in terms of pixels, which are the, the little imagers that, uh, that our digital images are, you know, are, are rendered with. Uh, the number of pixels varies from chip to chip and brand to brand. The number associated with this uh, total count is called, is, is offered in megapixels millions of pixels and that has to do with the resolution of the images okay so the pixel count on a chip uh it might be different from camera make and model to camera make and model but it's always going to correspond to uh, a native resolution um the standard uh definition 640 by 480 uh was the old standard the new high definition standard now uh for television broadcast is 1920 by 1080 pixels 1920 pixels wide by 1080 pixels high, okay? Ultra HD or 4K broadcast, 3840 by 2160, okay? And then of course DCI is 4096 by 2160. The capture devices are called CMOS sensors. Uh, the old broadcast standard were CCD sensors. It's just a difference in the energy standard uh, used between the two capture devices. CMOS ended up being more efficient when there was only one image capture device inside the camera. When there was three, they used CCD chips because of the power factor and the way the camera consumed battery power. Now with one chip and it's much bigger than the two thirds inch broadcast standard, the CMOS sensor tends to be the better, more power efficient capture device. So we use CMOS sensors in our cameras now. Um, each sensor is comprised of what we call photocytes or groups of pixels, and they're arranged by their color sensitivity, red, blue, and green, okay? By 
combining what the red sensors and the blue sensors and the green sensors see, we can create all the different colors from the rainbow from the visible spectrum by combining those three primary video colors, okay? <clears throat> I think it's basically saying the same thing, except that uh, we can say that each pixel, okay, 1920 by 1080, for instance, HD, it's those number of pixels consists of eight informational bytes. Okay, the same kind of bits and bytes that we use in computer files. So the, the image capture device is viewing and rendering an image using the photo sites on the chip and it's speaking in terms of bits and bytes, just like your computer does, which is why we now edit with Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve on our computer because our digital images now are all bits and bytes, ones and zeros, okay? 24 bits for, uh, uh, b -b 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 what was I trying to say? Uh, eight bits for black and white image, 24 bits for color image, okay? Uh, combinations of red, blue, and green, okay? Eight bits represents our lowest uh, broadcast standard, which is what we, uh, you'll also hear people refer to it as Rec 709. It's just a way of understanding that that broadcast standard has 255 possible color values. Okay. Uh, tw 10 or 12 bit color will have about 1024 color values present. Um, and then uh, 14 bit color uh, to 16 bit color will have well over a million color values possible from red, blue and green. Okay. So your color accuracy and the broad range of colors possible uh, with your capture device is gonna depend on how many bits of resolution the images are constructed in, 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit, or now the new 14-bit standard, okay? As of yet, I don't believe we have any cameras that record in a 16-bit standard. A pixel is the smallest addressable full color RGB element in a digital image or in an image device. The address of a pixel corresponds to a physical location on the sensor. Okay. A color is typically represented by three component intensities of red, blue, and green. Okay. These are the key points to remember. If you were to look at your sensor in terms of photo sites under a magnifying glass, you would see a pattern developing at high magnification showing you photosites that are sensitive to green, red, or blue. And then we take those in groups of, uh, it's technically groups of six. Uh, this is a nine uh, pixel group for a certain kind of a camera. Uh, and it creates one aggregate color value based on the color input of these eight sites. Um, in our cinema cameras, we have uh, six sites uh, arranged three by three uh, for red, blue, and green, okay? And then our digital processes and our cameras sample uh, the colors from the individual red, blue, and green sites, combine them all into an 8-bit, 10-bit, or 12-bit standard, and give us our range of colors uh, accordingly. If you could look at these photo sites under a magnifying glass, you would see that it's a domed lens and then it's a small, tiny, tiny, tiny sensor in the context of the larger sensor. So now what we understand is that that imager, that chip that we're calling a sensor in our camera is actually an array of many, many, many hundreds of thousands of smaller photo sites. Okay, each one tuned red, blue, or green. And it's like a little lens, light comes in, strikes the sensor, and the sensor records blue data, green data, or red data, okay? The way that these red, blue, and green sites are arranged uh, digitally and how they're encoded and decoded is called a Bayer process, B-A-Y-E-R. So you'll hear uh, some people might mention the Bayer color process or the Bayer sensors um, and all that is doing is referring to the arrangement of the color pixels on the surface of your chip. 
But if you think about it this way, all it is is it's a, it's it's an arrangement of colors that are possible. How many pixels, how many photo sites you have, how many pixels of resolution you have is going to determine how many colors you that are possible with the camera you're using. And the more sites you have, the more colors that you can that you can arrange, you can start creating images from that. I like this analogy right here with the crayons because this guy this artist here, this Christian Fowler, makes these uh, these interesting uh, images out of uh, the rainbow of colors, the little candies that he arranges to make these images. Kind of neat. But that's essentially what's happening. The more colors that are possible, the more we perceive to have the image to have more resolution and it has more color accuracy. Um, did you ever see a, an image on your TV screen or on your computer screen that's maybe uh, an image taken outside. And in the blue sky, you'll see kind of like streaks or weird sort of pixelated patterns in the blue sky. What that is, is what we call a digital artifact. In other words, the blue sky looks like a solid tone of blue, right? But really it is a, if you look at the horizon, you'll see the sky is closer to white in color and the higher you look up into the sky, the darker blue it gets. And that's a very, 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 very subtle gradation of the hue of blue from a very, very, very light blue at the horizon to a deeper, deeper, deeper sky blue at the zenith, at the very top of the sky, right? And a digital camera photographing that subtle of a gradation of a pure tone like blue sky, uh, it's just too much data. There's more data than that pixel or that chip can process, and you'll get that banding in the image, right? That's where the the color science of that particular chip failed. So a broadcast camera with an 8-bit color standard, and you're trying to shoot outside and film deep blue sky outside, you're going to get banding with that camera because 8 bits only gives you 255 total possible color values. And there might be more than 255 values of blue alone in that sky. Okay, so you would need a sensor that had much, much better color science, maybe at least 10 bit, probably 12 bit color for you to be able to shoot that image outside. Let's say it's a beautiful desert scene, right? And you got the mountains and the buttes in the background and then you got sandy cactuses in the foreground. And then you got this amazing blue sky with just a couple of fluffy clouds in it. In order to capture that image without any banding in the sky, you got to have at least a 12 bit image sensor. Okay, so you need to have oh millions of color values possible uh, from that sensor. Okay, and only some cameras are going to be able to record that way. And so it's going to depend on what kind of images you want to create with your camera, whether or not you need a camera with 8 bit color science, 10 bit color science, or 12 bit color science. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So if you looked at an 8-bit color space in terms of these are little um, color chips, um, it's like a it's like a Pantone scale, right? Uh, it's showing you all the different color values from zero to 255 uh, that you can get, and that includes black and gray values as well. Even though black and gray aren't really colors. They are present uh, and they do represent tones in the 0 to 255 uh, 8 bit matrix. Okay, that's why there's a grayscale at the bottom of this color chart. Okay, because here's 255 right here. Okay, and then 0 is absolute black. Okay, so really the data starts at 1, not 0, because 0 is the total complete lack of color, right? So from one to 255, you got all these, all these different color values in between, okay? It, it seems like a lot, but in, in reality, you know, if you look at a, uh, well, for instance, a really good still camera, like a, I don't know, a, a Nikon F, what is it now? They're up to like F800, something like that. Um, you know, it's gonna be able to record many millions of colors, right? But it's only one, image frame, one still photographic digital frame. So of course it can have, you know, 6 million colors, 
right? Like a 6K image would have over 6 million colors, but it's only one frame. If you were trying to shoot video at 24 frames a second to record motion and sound, you can't get that much data in that file at 24 times the size, right? That's just way too much data. You're gonna, you know, the system's not built to handle that much data crunching, those many numbers, right? So we have to do something called compressing all this information in order to shoot 24 frames a second and create digital video as opposed to one image, one photograph, okay? We call this bit depth, color depth, bit depth. The analysis of what this means is we refer to as color science. Every camera manufacturer in the market has their own uh, method of calculating or determining the color science of their cameras. Um, they spend a lot of money on R&D to uh, perfect the color rendering capabilities of their cameras the practices that they use and the technology they develop to uh, improve the color accuracy of their cameras is referred to as the color science uh, of that brand. So you'll hear some people say they prefer the color science of Blackmagic to the color science of Sony. Uh, that's because the way Sony uh, manufactures their devices to record color uh, uses slightly different algorithms and crunches numbers slightly differently than Blackmagic does. Uh, and as a result, uh, you'll see a difference in the color rendering quality between a Sony camera and a Blackmagic camera. And you'll probably prefer one over the other and you will probably, uh, given enough time uh, in using these uh, devices, you'll probably develop a sense of what, you know, what the difference is and which one you prefer, which one you like better. In the beginning, you might not see any difference between Blackmagic color rendering and Sony color rendering. But as you use these cameras, you'll start to be able to see the differences and then you may end up preferring one over the other. What is your preference, Professor? I'll tell you, when I first got into digital acquisition, which was in 2005, uh, the leader was Panasonic. Um, and the difference between Panasonic and Sony at that time, for instance, uh, was Sony was still making cameras that appealed to the standard definition television market, which as, as I showed you earlier, is 255 possible, 256 possible colors, right? If you include black. Um, that's what we call Rec 709 standard. And it was the standard color space for television at that time. And so their equipment all kind of you know, red looked a certain color and it didn't really look like real red. If you had, if you shot a, a like guys would go crazy uh, if they had to shoot a lipstick commercial, you know, you get the, some of those, some of those amazing red lipstick tones that are possible. Uh, and they'd be, you know, and the client would want to shoot the commercial on a video camera and the DPs would be like, why do you want to do that? I mean, the, the camera is never going to give you the, that amazing luster of red that your product demonstrates. Uh, by shooting this Rec 709 video. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Let's shoot your commercial on film so that the film stock has all of the ability to record that color completely accurately because it's a photochemical process. It's not electronic. Uh, it, it uses different you know, physics to create an image. Uh, and the colors are you know a million times more accurate with film than they are with video. So they would shoot all those makeup commercials and all those lipstick commercials on film and then only later in post-production would they transfer the film to digital video, high, you know, high quality digital video, even for those days, we called it digi, digi beta, uh, which was really good, had really good color science to it, even though it was video. Uh, and you could get a saturated red out of it, but the camera that shot digi beta was stupid big. And so you, you'd never wanna take that on location. So you'd shoot film and convert the film to digi beta for post-production, and then you could get better color quality out of the video. Uh, but if you took a regular you know, video camera into the field and tried to shoot a commercial with it and get Maybelline red lipstick to look real, it wasn't gonna happen. Uh, digital video is, is uh, much better now though. 
I still like Panasonic. Um, I think that the color that comes out of the GH5 looks natural, if if not a tiny bit sat too saturated for my taste. Um, and I like the Black Magic color. I just I just do. Um, initially, when the red cameras came out, I thought that the tone, the color quality that came out of the reds was interesting, and I and I chose that that descriptor very carefully because. I never said accurate. I said interesting. Okay, the color was not accurate out of the original red cameras. It was it was horrible in terms of color accuracy, but the color that came out of it was very industrial looking, and so it was the perfect kind of camera to use if you were shooting a post-apocalyptic sci-fi movie, if you were shooting a horror movie, if you were shooting something clinical. The color quality out of the red cameras seemed ideally suited for that kind of subject matter. But if you were shooting a, a, a period piece with color accurate costumes and specific color hues and palettes that were created by a production designer and you came on set with a red camera, they would laugh you off the set and tell you to go get a real camera and then you'd have to come back with a film camera. Okay, because the color science for the red wasn't ready for that kind of rendering. Um, so in the beginning, red cameras had a certain niche, right? So, hey, you want to shoot a movie like Prometheus? Hell yeah, let's shoot it on red cameras because it's all science fiction and computer screens and techie, weird industrial rocket ship lighting anyway. So let's shoot it on red cameras. And so they did. But you wanted to shoot something like uh, Anna Karenina? No, you, they were stay shot film, right? And then they had to transfer the film to digital later and then they had to manipulate it in post-production um so you know that was the world like five to seven years ago when this trouble started now we're eight or nine years into the digital revolution almost a full decade now and the color quality coming out of these cameras is such that you can shoot a movie like the revenant on an area alexa uh lt um, and it would be very difficult for you to tell the difference between that footage and footage shot on film because the color science in the area Lexus is so good now. Uh, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, for even the best of the best to figure out what was shot on what. And that includes Roger Deakins, who was a huge advocate of film and said he would never shoot on digital right up until uh, about 2008, 2009, and then Roger shot something on an Aria Alexa, and he was so impressed and so relieved that the digital technology had come so far along uh, that he made the switch and he never looked back. And as soon as a guy like that, who has all of these, you know, Academy Award nominations to his credit, and he shot all these amazing looking movies on film, when he finally embraced the digital technology, everybody else said, well, hell, if Roger thinks it's okay, it's good enough for me, you know? And then we had a real concerted push towards digital uh, and the manufacturers really stepped up their game. Uh, Blackmagic files now look 10 times better than they did when they, when they first started making cameras. Uh, Sony stuff looks, you know, 100 times better than it did in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Um, so now the color coming out of a Sony A7S III or an a7 III, the digital video you can get out of that little camera, looks amazing. It looks a lot like um, a GH5. Slightly different red. The reds are still different between Sony and Panasonic, but all the other color accuracy and saturation looks pretty comparable. The contrast is higher in the Sony camera than it is in the Panasonic. You can always add contrast to a digital image by manipulating the metadata, but it's hard to reduce contrast that's baked into the image. So it's harder to get rid of the contrast in a Sony camera if you don't like that contrast level than it is in a GH5. So if you'd rather shoot a low contrast image initially and then boost the contrast in post, you should pick a GH5. If you don't mind the baked in look and you wanna skip a step in post, shoot it on the A7S III and call it a day. So these are the kinds of choices that you're going to start making as you get familiar with the technology and how it works and how you can sort of play with it and, and get the results that you want.
Just quickly, here's the difference between 8, 10, and 12-bit color. It's just going to show you red, blue, and green, 256 times 256 times 256. <coughs> That's red, blue, and green, 256 each. Gives you a total of 16 million, over 16 million colors. 10-bit gives you 1,024 times three channels, which is over a billion colors. Right, and then 12 bit is 4096 times three, three different colors. 4096 times 4096 times 4096. 12 bit 4K or 6K video, 12 bit gives you over 68 billion possible color combinations. That's better than film, okay? Which is why most of the content that's produced now uh, is shot on digital cameras because they finally, sometime around 2000 and, uh, 2014, 2015, digital broke the film barrier and became higher quality, both in color accuracy and resolution to actual film stock. And at that point, it was official that film's days were numbered. Okay. With 68 billion possible color combinations, you're not going to have banding in a blue sky if you shoot digital video outside in the desert in Arizona. It's going to be beautiful. Now, the minute you crunch those files and compress them so they can be broadcast on television, you might get all that banding back because you had to compress your files in order to get them to get them small enough that you could beam them from one uh, from from one uh, network affiliate. Uh, uh, location to another, right? Beam them from Los Angeles to Minneapolis. You got to have a file small enough that you can satellite uplink that and get it to, uh, you know, play on the TVs in Minnesota's market, right? Which means you're back down to 8-bit color standard, which means you get the banding in the sky again. So it's kind of, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of push and pull and there's a lot of compromise uh, depending on how you originate an image and how you present the image, right? So you should always be thinking about where your images are gonna be seen, to what standard are they gonna be seen? What's the expectation of quality in that venue? Is it, it the internet? Is it a photograph? Is it video? Is it video that plays in a theater? Or is it video that plays on TV? Because those are two different quality expectations. Is it video that plays on YouTube? Because that's yet another expectation altogether right? Or is it going to be internal video or closed circuit video where you're going to have an audience looking at a monitor uh, in a closed loop that's not accessible outside of that ecosystem? You know, like a, you know, a live event, for instance, presentation of some kind. All right, then you can control the standards and therefore you can control the quality of exhibition. It's always going to be what's my end product and then I'm going to match it to the technology that's available. And hopefully I have a budget that'll that'll be able to balance between how I create the image and how I present the image. So the only thing left to talk about then is, let's talk about the media, right? How do I know how much time I have on a data card if I'm shooting with a Panasonic GH4, let's say, <coughs> okay? And this is what used to mess people up in the very beginning of digital uh, digital acquisition because we weren't thinking about something called bit rate, which is how fast our cameras are recording the data in an image file, okay? Because you can record 4K in a camera with a low bit rate and 4K in a camera with a high bit rate, right? And the difference will be total file size uh, per a given segment of time. So if you if you turn on a camera for five seconds at a low bit rate and then turn a different camera on with a high bit rate for five seconds, the, the file size of the high bit rate camera for the same five seconds is gonna be massive compared to the data file of the camera that with a low bit rate that was only on for five seconds. Okay, so what is, what's the difference? What does that mean? Well, what it means is your media the difference will be how much information you can put on your media card. So you need to know how quickly your capture device records data, and then you need to know a little bit about data 
and you need to know the size of the card and the capability of the card to be able to figure out how much time you can get on that card. It sounds like a lot. A lot of the manufacturers will try to tell you, oh, 4K is one gigabyte per second. Not necessarily, not anymore, because Sony, who's telling you, you know, one gig a second, is telling you based on their data uh, standards from five years ago. Black Magic blows their data out of the water. If you try to calculate a gigabyte per second with Black Magic, you're going to be really wrong. You're going to be off by a lot, and you're going to have less time, less recording time on your data cards than you think you have. So you can't rely on information that's on the internet that came five years ago because it's none of it is none of it's accurate anymore. Well, how do we do it? If you look at any data card, okay, there's a whole bunch of information on this data card. How many of you are familiar with data cards and and you know what you know what the information is and all that business? Is this all new to you guys, or have you heard this all before? If you've heard it all before, you know, I can shortcut the conversation, but if you haven't, I'll give you the full workup. I probably have, but I'd need a refresher. Okay. S same with me too. Well, that's fair. All right. Well, okay. So if you take a data card, pull a data card out of your camera, you know, uh, and take a look at what, let me see if I got one in this camera, probably not. Uh, I got one in here, pull one out of the GH4. Okay, so I got a Sony data card in the GH4. Um, it's gonna be pretty close specs wise. Actually, my specs are better than the one I have on the screen right now. Um, basically, I'll tell you what each one of these, nomen what this nomenclature stands for, okay? So let's go right through the alphabet and we'll look at this. So letter A is pointing at this sort of, it looks like a vessel holding the number one. Okay, that's a UHS number and it's a series number and it's class one, which is a certain speed of data that can be read or recorded onto that card. Let's just stop there for a minute, okay? Every data card has a built-in speed limit. There's two actually. There's a data speed limit for how fast you can read data off the card. And there's a speed limit for how quickly you can record data to that card. Okay. Many cards, especially in the beginning, you could read data off a card a lot quicker than you could record data to that card. Okay. In the beginning. But in the beginning, we had digital video cameras that were shooting at 25 megabits a second, right? Which by today's standards is a real slow camera. <coughs> we got cameras now that record at megabits per second, like a thousand megabits per second. Okay. So 25 megabits per second, five years ago was really, really slow. Okay. Um, all this is doing is talking to you about speed class. Letter B is telling you how quickly you can read data off of this card. Okay, so this is the read speed, we call it, of the card. And you notice how it's a big M and a big B over little s, right? Megabits is designated by capital M, small b, s, MBS megabits per second. Megabytes per second is big M, big B over S. There's a difference there in terminology and what the specs are for megabits versus megabytes. I'm going to tell you in a second. Just hold that thought. This is the read speed of the card. G is talking about also a speed class, class 10. So class 10 and UHS speed class one are on the same read write speed standard. Okay. Um, classes of cards haven't gone past class 10 in a very long time. However, the UHS or the bus speed of the cards has increased because some of the cards now have more than one row of pins on the backside of your card 
A lot of cards have only one row of pins. Okay, especially if the card is a year or two old. A card that was just made a couple of weeks ago and came from the manufacturer might have two rows of pins. Okay, that's a different UHS bus speed because if you have twice as many pins, in theory, you could transmit twice as much data, right? So the speed classes of cards with two rows of pins are gonna become the standard very, very soon in terms of our cameras and how quickly they can record data. It's gonna have a, re a very real practical application that you might figure out by the end of this discussion or you might not. Okay, let's go back to our card. All right, so we got a UHS bus class. We have a speed class. The speed is the, read, the, the write speed class of 10. The read speed, 45 megabytes per second. Letter C is telling us whether it is an SD, secured digital data card, in high capacity or extended capacity or extreme capacity. Sandist Extreme is the brand. Extreme capacity SD card is what they call it, right? That's what letter C is telling us. Expanded or extreme capacity just means how many megabits can be in an image file before the processor in your camera because of the card has to break the data up into groups okay which have to be reassembled later by your uh, digital editing system when you import video files from the card into your nle all right if you have a, a high capacity card i think the maximum is 400 megabits in a file or me, I'm sorry, megabytes in a file. If your file is bigger than that, um, it'll take the, the whole file and break it up into 400 megabyte chunks. And you don't see it, it's in the metadata, but when that file is imported into your NLE off the card, <clears throat> in order for you to view that video file through your NLE, the NLE has to have the ability to stitch those groups back together into one big video file again. And the metadata tells it how to do that. Okay, but that adds to your processing uh, speeds uh, and it can bog down your computer if you're using the wrong kind of card or the cameras. Now, if you put a if you put an SD high capacity or SDHC video card in a in a modern digital cinema camera, it'll just tell you that it can't record on the card. It'll tell you there's a problem with the card. Okay. Um, because it's probably, you know, the processing speed of that card is probably inferior to the speed with which that camera wants to record to that card and the amount of data per second it wants to record onto that card is far in advance of the card's capability at this point. So this is why you, you probably can't, if you owned a Blackmagic cinema camera and you ran into um, Walgreens on a Friday night at 11.30 p.m. because you needed another data card for your film shoot, you're probably not gonna be able to buy a data card at Walgreens that your Blackmagic camera is gonna be able to use. It's either gonna be a different card standard that Walgreens doesn't carry, or it's gonna be a card spec that Walgreens doesn't carry. And the specs will be you know, much, much higher than the type of stuff you'd see on the shelf at the local drugstore. You're just not gonna be able to do it. You're gonna have to go to the photo store or B&H online and order a new data card for your camera. And then you're not gonna have it, you know, Friday night at 11.30 PM because, you know, none of the vendor, none of the pro vendors are open at that point. So <clears throat> this is why you wanna know how much data you can put on your cards so that you can calculate ahead of time and make sure you have enough cards for your shoot and that you're not gonna run out of recording space on your data cards as a result. So you want at least an XC card these days for your digital video. HC won't cut it. But about the only thing you can use HC in anymore are like um, quadcopters, like drones, uh, because they're only up for a short period of time anyway. And the clips you're recording in a drone, chances are, are fairly short. They're not long strings of dialogue from an actor it's a shot, you know, flying over a house or down the road or whatever. And chances are five or six seconds of that is plenty and you don't need any more of it. it just gets monotonous. So your clips are shorter in a quadcopter and therefore they might still fit. They might still fit on an HC card, but 
that's hard to say. Um, this is another class category. Okay, this is uh, class one, which is, I don't even know, I think that is referring also to the number of pins on the back side of that card. Yeah, it is. It's the number of pins on the back side. So I know without seeing the back of this card, it's a an extended capacity card. Um, the class 10 tells me how fast it records video to the card. Class 10 happens to be 30 megabytes per second. Okay, you see here 30 megabytes on this graph. UHS-3 and V30, I'm sorry, 10 megabytes. Here, class 10, 10 megabytes. So the fastest I can record to this card is 10 megabytes per second. It's still fairly fast. Most cameras can accommodate that. They have a, a low speed setting that that would accommodate that just fine. Uh, and you can read off of it at 45 megabytes per second. Okay. And then F is pointing to the total capacity of the card, 128 gigabytes. Okay. So in order for all this data to make sense, we have to know some stuff. Um, here are the different card standards that we have right now that are for all practical purposes, what we're using in our digital cinema cameras. I don't have any compact cards or micro class cards pictured here, um, but usually if it's a micro class card, uh, it'll still have the specs of the, of the parent card of the original size, uh, just in a smaller form fitting standard, which requires a card adapter. Uh, before you put it into your computer or your laptop. Uh, this is an SD card, Secure Digital. This is a CFast card, which is part of the compact flash technology that originated uh, with photo camera, photo, digital photo cameras uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and it became CFast because it has a faster data rate standard, um, but it's still in a, a card that's basically the same size as a compact flash but it's not the same speed standard. Therefore, a compact flash card that was made 10 years ago, uh, even though it looks like it's the right size for your Blackmagic uh, 6K pocket camera, won't even fit in the slot. There'll be a little tab that denies the card from being put in all the way. Okay, so this is a CFast card. And then this is a hard drive. A lot of the cameras now, because they have such high bit rates, in other words, they, they record so much data in the course of a second, um, that these cards don't even offer enough recording space to make it worthwhile. So you need a, a hard drive like a Samsung. Uh, this is a T5 drive, which holds, I believe, a minimum of uh, 556 gigabytes. And then they go up from there to like a terabyte and two terabytes, uh, which is a lot of space, you would think. Uh, but when you're shooting high resolution video, and then maybe at a high frame rate, for instance, you're shooting slow motion, uh, you're recording a ton of data and therefore you need a hard drive with a lot of space on it compared to a data card, which is not gonna hold much time at all if you're using high data rate standards. All right, so I think I told you, SD stands for secure digital, SDHC is secure digital high capacity, and then XC is secure digital extended capacity. Um, and then CFast came out of compact flash technology. So we've just talked about all of that. So on this particular card, we, we're gonna see a few things. We're gonna see the brand and the model of the card, the type of card, XDXC uh, class uh, or, or bus uh, class one. And V30 is a new standard that we're seeing now on this card. V30 stands for video 30 megabytes per second. So even though it's a, class 10 card, this card specifically is meant for shooting video because it has a video standard V30 incorporated in the nomenclature of the card. This is very important, okay? This card doesn't say V30 on it. So the only way we know how fast we can record to this card is by the class 10 insignia right here on the legend, right? Class 10 is stands for 10 megabytes per second, uh, maximum write speed to the card. Remember, 45 megabytes per second is the read speed of the card. 10 megabytes per second is the write speed of the card. Two different things, right? This card says V30 class 10. 
when you have both speed standards listed in the nomenclature of your data card, what that's telling you is that under normal circumstances, uh, without the camera overheating or unless you have any special parameters dialed in like high speed cinematography, for instance, sometimes high speed, high frame rate cinematography can mess up the right speed uh, or the writing process to a data card and you can get what we call dropped frames. Frames that don't end up being recorded on the card, they're missing, right? And it throws off your, uh, it throws off your timing cycle uh, on playback in your NLE and you have to repair it, okay? Um, it's telling you with these two standards that you have a high speed write speed under normal video circumstances of 30 megabytes per second, not the standard 10. 10 becomes the minimum write speed of this card and V30, 30 megabytes per second becomes the maximum write speed of the card. So now you can write to this card at 30 megabytes per second, as opposed to this one, which was only 10. And that was designated by the class 10 logo right here. Okay. Do you see the difference? Do you see where the V30 is appearing on this card right here? Yes. So you've got, they're both SanDisk cards. They're both SanDisk Extreme cards. But this one is called Extreme Pro because it has a video speed designation of 30. <coughs> so what does that mean? If we look at this chart again, we can see the video standard uh, of the speed classes as they emerge alongside the traditional write speed classes of two through 10 something magical happened at class 10 all the video standards kind of lined up with one row of pins your maximum write speed was 10 megabytes per second and that was true for the video pro standard as well as the regular video standard 10 megabytes per second <coughs> but when they broke the uhs class barrier and started going with class three and there's another class that's probably going to come out in the next six months or so which will be even faster uh, the standard went from 10 megabytes per second to 30 megabytes per second. And what they found, even with UHS class, speed class three, that they could achieve in some cases under normal unstressed conditions for the camera, as many as 90 megabytes per second record speed to a card. But a card with this kind of speed class designation is not going to cost you $19.95 at Best Buy. It's going to cost you about two hundred dollars. Okay. It's a difference in specs and performance. Okay. V thirty is pretty good for most stuff, and when I say most stuff, I say average knock around video at twenty four frames per second, without doing anything fancy or special. Now, what do I mean by fancy or special? Well, let's talk about what these cameras are capable of. This video explains basically what I have just described to you uh, in layman's terms again. Um, and it is embedded in web courses for you. And I uh, recommend that you check it out. It's only six minutes, but I don't want to stop here <clears throat> so that he can repeat everything I just told you. But check it out and uh, see what you think. We need to know and talk about bits versus bytes for a few minutes so we can figure out what these cards are doing. <clears throat> Excuse me, bits versus bytes. Bits, computers deal with bits, binary digits. That's, it's a, it's a portmanteau uh, of binary digits. It's a word construct, in other words. Binary digits is bits, okay? A bit can be a one or a zero when we're talking about data or metadata. Uh, the equivalent of a switch in the on position or the off position, okay? A byte in terms of data and file size consists of eight binary digits or eight bits. Eight ones or eight zeros or a combination of ones and zeros up to eight in a byte. <coughs> so what does that mean? 
if this card has a minimum write speed of 10 megabytes per second, and you want to know how many bits that is, you have to multiply this by eight. Does that make sense? If the write speed of this card is 10 megabytes per second, then the equivalent in bits per second is 800, right? Or 80, I'm sorry. 80 megabits per second, because it's a byte times eight gets you to bits. 10 times eight is 80, right? So if you have a Sony Handycam that records at 50 megabits per second or 25 megabits per second, then you can use this card effectively. You could use this card in that same camera because it writes at 10 megabytes or 80 megabits per second. So the Sony camera can write just fine to this card. Okay. But if I tried to put this card in my Panasonic GH5, which has a minimum bit rate of 100 megabits per second, my, my smallest file in a GH5 is recorded at 100 megabits per second. I can't use this card, can I? Because the maximum write speed, the speed limit of this card is 80 megabits per second. And my camera records at 100 megabits per second. So my camera is gonna reject this card immediately. Or it's gonna record for about three to five seconds and then I'm gonna get a message in my in my menu window on my LCD that says recording stopped. Uh, you got a problem with the card, basically get a different card, essentially is what the message tells you. Okay. So I need a better card. I need a card maybe with a video standard like this one. <clears throat> this is a V30 card. A V30 card has a faster video standard, 30 megabytes per second. Now multiply that by eight and you get 240 megabits per second, right? So my GH5 has three bit rate standards. It'll shoot low res 4K and standard HD at 100 megabits per second. It'll shoot medium 4K, fairly robust file sizes at 200 megabits per second and it'll shoot really fine quality 4K video or 4K 60P at 300 megabits per second. Can I use this card with my GH5? I got three standards, 100, 200, and 300 megabits per second. Can I use this card? What's the maximum write speed of this card? I just told you. It's 30. 30 what? 30 megabits per second. Nope. Or megabytes, sorry. Okay. How many how many megabits is 30 megabytes? How many bits are in a byte? Uh, 10, right? 10? Who have you been listening to for the last two hours? Eight. Is it 240? It's 240. This card writes at 240 megabits per second. Can I use it on my GH5? I have three speed standards on my GH5, 100, 200, and 300 megabits per second. Can I use this card in my GH5? Yes, you could. Clarify. You could, because you said you had 100, 200, and 300, and if it gives us 240 megabits, then that's within the limitations of your GH5. With one exception. There's something I can't do with this card in my GH5. <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> my 300 megabits per second standard was for high density 4K or 4K 60P. I can't record high speed 60P on this card because the data rate of the card is slower than the data rate of my camera. My camera records too fast for this card in high density 4K or in 60P 4K. High speed has a lot to do with what kind of media we can use. And it has everything to do with your camera's processor and it creates huge data files. <clears throat> this is why not all 4K video cameras will record slow motion. You have to shoot high frame rates to record slow motion. And when you do that, either the processor overheats or the data of the files is way too big for the camera to be able to handle. And so it, it just can't give you high speed. It can't give you slow-mo, okay? And so your card and the type of card you use is gonna have a lot to do with whether or not you can shoot high speed. So if, you're, if, you're, if you wanna shoot a, a wine commercial and you wanna get a, a slow-mo splash shot, you know, the prototypical, you know, milk crown or wine crown in a wine commercial, and you wanna shoot 120p on a new uh, Zcam, E2 or uh, Zcam F6, you want to shoot 120 frames, can't do it on this card. If I can't do 60 frames on this card, I sure as heck can't do 120 frames. Okay, that's what these other video standards are for that are just coming out now. V60s are out. There's a few, there's a couple of V90s that are out and you can get them at B&H and they're super expensive. Um, there's a company out there called Angelbird that creates SD cards for video professionals that can perform at high bit rates, but they're astronomically expensive. <clears throat> Not very practical right now. But you can get some reasonably priced V60 cards. Um, and then I use V60 cards in my GH5 because if I want to shoot high density 4K at 60p, I need to be able to shoot at at least I need to be able to record at or write to my card at at least 300 megabits per second. And the more megabits per second I can write to the card, the higher the number, okay, the less likely I'm going to have dropped frames or, or errors in my digital files because the card will be able to write faster than the camera can supply it with data, which is totally fine. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a lot to take in, but I'm trying to. Yeah. bring it all in my mind. So 60 megabytes per second is how many megabits per second? <clears throat> 480. Yep. Six times eight is 48. Add a zero. 480. 480 is not bad. 480 is a little bit less, unfortunately, than say a red standard from a, um, what's the new Dragon 6K, let's say, or the Helium 8K, you know, they're recording at many, many more megabits per second. Oddly enough, a high resolution HD file out of a Canon 5D, because the sensor is full frame, it's a big sensor, uh, is I think a little over 500 megabits per second believe it or not. Um, some of the new Sony gear is, is six or 800 megabits per second. Um, the new uh, Blackmagic 12K cameras, like over a thousand megabits per second in some, in some of the shooting modes. So those cameras don't even have SD card slots in them anymore because the SD standard isn't, isn't fast enough, right? So they have different cards. That's where you might want say a CFast card because a CFast card, I think will record up to 600 megabits per second if I'm not mistaken. It's at least 400, at least 400, okay? But I think it's more than that because this one will give us, uh, where was I? Um, the V60 card will give us 480 megabits per second and an SD card. So I think the CFast cards are even more than that. I think they're 600. 
which would include some of the modes of the black magic 12k all of the modes of the black magic uh um ursa mini pro g2 all of the modes of the canon c series of cameras with the exception of the seven the 500 mark ii and the 700 okay most of the really nice video cameras that are out there uh, can be accommodated by a v60 card very few of them can um so <clears throat> you got to know what your camera is doing and then understand how to interpret the nomenclature on your card to know <clears throat> the last thing we need to know is for how long can I do it? Okay. And that's where this starts coming in. So now we want to calculate. So I'm going to take a really basic example of how to use this information to calculate the record time on your card. Then I'm going to let you all go because I can see your brains melting. All right. If the bit rate of your camera is 100 megabits per second, we know that a V30 or a UHS class three SD card will be sufficient because the write speed of a V30 card is 30 megabytes per second or 240 megabits per second. If we're gonna use a GH5 with a bit rate of 400 megabits per second, sorry, 400, not 300, we will need a V60 card, which writes at 60 megabytes per second or 480 megabits per second. Okay. 400 is with the upgrade, by the way. I don't think I upgraded mine yet. Next, we need to choose an SD card and figure out the capacity. We do that by calculating the bit rate of our camera per minute, then dividing that number into the capacity of the card. Or we can calculate the capacity of an existing card based on its total file capacity. For instance, if we have a 64 gigabyte SD card, that's UHS class three, which is v, uh, V30. And we want to shoot at 100 megabits per second on a Sony camera. What's the recording time? Okay, we got to do a little bit of math. Now, what I did is I, I made a little formula, which is in the next frame. <clears throat> but I'll walk you through it here, and then I'll show you the formula. Start by multiplying the total capacity of the card by 1024. Where did I get that number from? On the previous slide, I stopped at bytes and bits. I should have went all the way to megabytes. Gigabytes, there are 1,024 megabytes in a gigabyte. <clears throat> if you want to start whittling this down, it's, it's weird that the camera bitrate standards are not in gigabytes. It's very strange, but I think that's because it's it's been an evolution over time. And as the technology gets better, the speeds have inherently gotten better. But the discussion originally was accommodating cameras that recorded at very slow bit speeds. So <clears throat> we were talking about bits and bytes, maybe kilobytes per second, um, but not really megabytes or gigabytes until a couple of years ago. Now we're talking about gigabytes. So we got to convert it all back down to megabyte, megabits per second because the cameras are still specced in megabits per second. So there's 1,024 mega, megabytes in a gigabyte. So we take the capacity of the card and we divide, or I'm sorry, we multiply by 1024. So 64 times 1024 is going to give you a number. Okay, that's going to get you to megabytes per second. Then you're going to multiply that value by 8 to get from megabytes to megabits, okay? So who's got a calculator? Uh, it's like 500. 64 and... times 1024 is what? 65,536. Times eight. 524,288. That sounds right, okay. That converted mega megabytes to megabits. Then we're gonna divide that big number that you just told me, okay, by the product of the megabits per second of the camera and the number 60. Okay, the camera's in megabits per second and we wanna know how many minutes of recording time we have. So we're gonna multiply the camera speed, 100 megabits per second <clears throat> times 60 and we get 6,000. 6,000. So now we want to take that 524,000 number 
and divide it by 6,000. And what do you get? 87 point whatever. 87.38 minutes mm -hmm. that card or one hour and 27 minutes of record time. Now notice I didn't say HD or 4K. You can record 4K at 100 megabits per second. You can record HD at 300 megabits per second, okay? So the resolution standard and the bit rate of the camera are kind of two different things. It really doesn't necessarily have to do with resolution. My GH5 has three 4K resolution standards, 100, 200, and 300, now 400 with an upgrade, megabits per second <coughs> in 4K. The GH4, I think you can record HD at 200 megabyte, megabits per second in just regular old HD. So you need to, you need to kind of keep both things in mind at the same time your resolution standard and your camera's megabits per second at that resolution standard. So if this was four, 4K at 100 megabits per second, probably not. It's probably HD at 100 megabits per second, right? Because that would be a better looking file than 4K at 100 megabits per second, right? Uh, you can have an hour and 27 minutes of HD on a 64 gigabyte XE V30 class three card. Okay. So <clears throat> you need to start thinking about the difference between 1080p and 2160, right? HD versus 4K in terms of how fast the camera is writing data to the card. Okay. Because you can have a hose, right? You can be watering your garden, right? And you could have the hose on full blast, but it's a regular, it's a standard garden hose, right? So if you water your garden for three minutes, five minutes with the garden hose, <clears throat> there's gonna be X amount of water on the ground. Would you agree? Garden hose on for five minutes, watering the garden gives you X amount of water on the ground after five minutes. Now let's water the garden with a fire hose, which is like four times the size of your garden hose for the same five minutes. Okay, water the garden with a fire hose for five minutes and you're gonna have four X the garden hose in terms of water on the ground. Does that make sense? four times as much water on the ground as the garden hose for the same interval of five minutes at full blast. Because the fire hose is four times thicker and it's pushing four times more water through per second as the garden hose, right? So if you were filling a swimming pool with a garden hose, in five minutes, you would have a little bit of water at the bottom of the pool, but certainly not enough to go swimming. But if you filled it with a fire hose, you might actually be able to get in and splash around a little bit. Because four times as much water per second is entering the swimming pool with a fire hose. Okay, it's kind of the same analogy with these data cards and how fast your camera is right, right speed is. Does it make sense if you think about it in terms of the fire hose and the garden hose? It's all about the interval of time. And what's the difference in the standard? Garden hose versus fire hose, HD versus 4K. Same time, five minutes of HD and five minutes of 4K. It's four times as much data, right? So the card has to be able to handle not only the resolution increase in file size, but also the 4K camera happens to write at three or 400 megabits per second, and the HD camera writes at 100 megabits per second or 200 megabits per second, okay? As long as you understand that and you can plug it into a very simple mathematical formula like this one, <clears throat> you can determine every piece of media that you're gonna come in contact with. You need to know what camera you're using so you know the bit speed and that'll be in the camera specs. You need to know what you're shooting, how long does the camera need to be on uh, per take or is it on at a clip like for an interview? 
uh, and how long is the content? How long is the interview? So let's say you're going to shoot 4K for Frontline, an interview with Joe Biden, President Biden, and you don't want to cut the camera because you don't want to miss a single word that he says. So you're going to let that camera roll from the beginning of the interview to the end of the interview, and you're never going to cut. And the interview you have is for 60 minutes, <clears throat> and the interview is going to last for a half an hour. Your camera is going to be on for 30 minutes at 4K at whatever bit rate that camera is that you've chosen. How much data card do you need to accommodate that kind of capacity? And this is where that comes in handy, right? If you're shooting, you know, two, three minute, 60 second, 30 second clips here and there, and you're shooting features, there's an easy way to kind of circumvent all this calculating. Just buy the biggest card you can afford at the fastest write speed. And as long as your camera can handle the UHS uh, bus standard, one set of pins or two rows of pins, then that's all you need to know. <clears throat> but you're going to probably pay five times, 10 times more for a card than you need to as a result of not doing the math. So the total card capacity in minutes, C sub M, is equal to the total capacity of the card in gigabytes times 1024 to get you to megabytes times eight to get you to megabits divided by the camera's bit rate, C sub BR, times 60 to get you to minutes. That's it. That's the formula. And you can tell what any data card is good for if you know your camera's bit rate. <laughs> okay? So if you have a client that has a budget of, let's say you're, they want you to shoot a commercial for them right? Uh, they want all the media when it's done. They don't want you to transfer any media to hard drives. It's proprietary content. It's a brand new prototypical sports car, right? So they don't want you to transfer cards to a hard drive. They want you to shoot on data cards and then give them all the data cards at the end of the shoot day, right? But they've only got a budget of say $200 for data cards, right? And you just did the math and you know that on a 64 gigabyte data card, you can shoot 23 minutes of 4k at 300 megabits per second, right? And you're shooting a car commercial, 23 minutes. I don't know, that's a lot of information, but maybe you got a lot of setups, you got cars driving down the highway, cars driving in the you know, in the salt flats in Utah, you got cars driving down the road in Monument Valley, you got, you know, cars at the beach, cars in the mountains, you know, cars on the Autobahn, you got all kinds of content you're shooting, right? <clears throat> Maybe you want four data cards. You can get V60 data cards for about 50 bucks a piece, right? Um, as long as V fit, V60 fits the standard of your card and it does for the GH5, you could shoot on the GH5 and it'd be okay in terms of your data and in terms of your cards. You would have at that point 80, 92 minutes of total content, right? But if your card shoots or your camera shoots faster than that and you need Angelbird cards, V90 cards, uh, and they're about $250 a piece you're over budget already for data cards. They only had 200 bucks to begin with. So you can't pick a camera that shoots with an angel bird V90 uh, because you're broke the budget for data cards. So you need to pick a camera that shoots at a lowered bit standard and then you can afford the data cards. It's just a, it's just a numbers game. It's all it is. It's really accounting more than anything else. Just understand that a V30 card writes pretty quick, 30 megabytes per second times eight, 240 megabits per second. And most of, most of the consumer cameras will handle that. A7S2, A7S3, uh, GH5 and all but the high resolution, high speed modes. Um, Blackmagic pocket camera in the low resolution modes. Um, you know, you can do a lot with a V30 card. V60 card, you can do even more. Then, you know, all the prosumer stuff, 
all the consumer stuff, you're fine with V60 cards. You're going to pay about 50 to 80 bucks a card. <clears throat> and that's for 64 gigabytes or 23 minutes per card at 300 megabits per second. Okay. But if you're aware of what all this stuff does, I think it helps you choose the gear a little bit more efficiently, right? You're never going to be in the dark about whether or not you got the right data card, because all you got to do is look at the specs of your camera and do that quick little bit of math. Have I totally blown you guys away now with this little exercise? I didn't mean to. It always seems easier in my head when I'm thinking about it than it, and it, and it is when I present it to a group because then I get the feedback from the group and it's usually mixed emotions. Like some people are horrified and they never want to talk about cameras again. And other people are like, well, if I can control my fear and just you know last the rest of the semester, I might master this by the end. And that's usually the case. It's really not that bad and it doesn't change. That, that's the good thing. The, the quality standards and the quality of the cards can change over time, but the formula will never change because there's always going to be eight bits per byte. That's never going to change, I don't think, uh, unless we go to some weird standard like pixie dust or something strange like that from the DARPA <laughs> division of the government, you know. Uh, there's always going to be eight bits per byte, and there's always going to be 1,024 bytes per, you know, this and that and the other. Every time you make a jump, uh, bytes to kilobytes to megabytes to gigabytes, you multiply by a factor of 1024, 1,024. That's always going to be the same, right? So the only thing that might change is the write speed of the cards and the bitstream or the data rate of the cameras that's going to keep increasing but the formula will never change okay so if you can embrace this and understand basically what this represents which is just the total size of your card getting it to megabits per second that's what's happening on the top of the divisor and on the bottom of the design divisor it's your camera bit rate times seconds to minutes times 60 that's it it's really all that it is. And then you can tell what any data card will do with the camera you've chosen. Okay. So I was gonna show you some stuff like, I was gonna talk to you about the right speed of certain consumer electronics like DVDs and CDs and stuff, but that's all, you know, if your brain already hurts, I don't wanna go any further than that. But this is just a reiteration of the V60, V, uh, V30, V60, V9, V90 standards. Um, here is a quick rundown of the cameras. These are mostly the cameras you guys have here at UCF with a couple of exceptions. You guys never got the evil, the evil ones. Uh, and as of yet, you haven't received the Pocket or the GH5, but you got all these other cameras. 60D, 46 megabits per second. 5D, 500 megabits per second motion JPEG, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, the original, 122 to 184 megabits per second. The new Blackmagic Pocket 4K, 255 to 270 megabits per second. You got a lot of these at the school, the Blackmagic uh, 4.6K, the Ursa Mini, 312 megabits per second. Here's a Sony F3, which is an HD camera, and in its day was a fairly expensive camera. Eight years ago, it's got a bit rate of 35 megabits per second. This is the, this is the turtle of the group. <laughs> Slow, but it gets there. The quality out of this camera is very, very good, but it's only 35 megabits per second. So the data packets are small, the file sizes are small, um, and it only, it, you know, it only shoots HD because <clears throat> this is way too slow for 4K. You got to have at least 100 megabits per second for, for decent 4K. Sony has a weird voodoo of how to get 4K out of 68 megabits per second. But I don't trust it. Something weird about it. And so sometimes your Sony files are not compatible with your NLE or you'll cr the comp computer crashes for weird reasons. It's because the Sony weird compression voodoo is trying to make 
4K out of a bit rate that's just too slow. Panasonic EVA 1, 100 to 400 megabits per second, and the GH5, 150 to 400 megabits per second. If you know these numbers and you know the formula, you can pick any data card and tell if it's going to be sufficient for your gig or not. Fortunately, um, the guys over at your, uh, your equipment room have chosen data cards that were kind of future proof in a way they picked uh, V30 and V60 uh, SanDisk Extreme Pro cards, uh, minimum of like 64 gigabytes, nothing smaller than that, so that uh, the data cards, you know, the money they invested in data cards wouldn't be money poorly spent in two or three years. So you're good to go with most of the stuff that's available here at UCF if you start renting gear for your film projects. But if you got to go buy something at Best Buy, take some notes and bring the notes with you and calculate it out whether or not the cards are going to work when you get there. The higher the bit rate, the better the quality. That's a for sure. 4K versus 4K, 100 bits per second versus three or 400 bits per second. The 4K at 400 bits per second is gonna have better image quality than the 4K at 100 bits per second, period. More data means more granularity, means more detail, color-wise, resolution-wise, everything. The camera is not compressing and therefore losing data uh, by recording at a slower speed. Okay, so a higher bit rate is better for quality overall, visual and color quality overall. And here's a quick list of some of the stuff out on the market. And this list is a couple of years old by now. Look at these red cameras, red 4K. <laughs> Nobody shoots 4K on the red anymore. Even the Raven is 4.6K, 151 megabits per second. Um, the Kinefinity camera, 322 megabits per second in 4K. Um, just a generic ProRes 422 wrapper in 4K, 503 megabits per second. Blackmagic 4K, 1.4 gigabytes per second. <laughs> We're finally starting to see the gigabyte standard here now with all the cameras at the bottom because look at that, it's just huge. Phantom Flex high-speed cameras, Sony F65 professional studio camera, two gigabytes per second. <laughs> that 64 gigabyte card, if it would even fit in the Sony camera, would give you about 30 seconds of video. <laughs> that's how much data is being pushed by the F65. So that's kind of funny, but it really is true. That's what's that's what's going on. So, um, and compression is just the camera taking this volume of data and throwing out the the data that is redundant. So data in a blue sky is different than data in a shot of a rose bush. The shot of the rose bush has a lot more detail. It's got different colors and values to it. And so the pixels are critical in the picture of the rose bush, but the picture of the sky where there's all these blue values that are virtually the same, the camera's compression ratio or the compression algorithm will look at all that common blue data from the, the sky file and throw out a ton of blue data because you don't need as much uh, resolution data to record a blue sky. Uh, and it'll throw it all out in order to make that file size smaller. But when you do that and you play it back on your Rec 709 monitor, you might see a little banding in the blue sky. That's what's happening. The compression is throwing out re, uh, residual or redundant data. <clears throat> we can talk about resolution again another time when we talk about cameras some more, but. Um, there's a little video you can check out, Understanding Codecs. Um, it's on uh, web courses. Check it out. Codec just stands for Code Decode Algorithm, and it's, uh, it's talking about what compression is and uh, how it works. Um, it's an eight-minute video. It's not too bad. Um, check it out. Uh, and then I've given you a PDF uh, for your reading assignment. It's uh, Memory Card Basics, which is basically what we talked about today. Uh, and then you got an optional reading assignment if you want to know more um, in the Cinematography Theory and Practice third edition, which is the blue, uh, um, the blue brown book, I call it. 
<laughs> um, the chapter on cameras and sensors is pretty interesting because it talks about pixels and uh, bit rate and stuff like that. If you want to know more, you don't have to read that though. Just check out the PDF that I gave you guys. Uh, it's 15 pages and it talks about basically everything we talked about today. Okay. I know this was a whopper of a session. Um, and I hope I didn't scare you away at this point. Um, it's probably as technical as we're going to get this semester. Um, but it's a hump. You got to get over it. Once you do, it's smooth sailing from there. So um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Um, we can have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session if you want, if you need to go over it again. Or if you just got a quick question about something that I went over with you in the video, um, you know, shoot me a message and I'll, I'll answer you back. Or uh, I'm going to put this recorded session up uh, tonight on web courses. You can go back and watch the video again, you know, and listen to me droning on about bitrate. Okay. So that's all I've got for you. You're probably like, thank God. Um, anybody have any questions right now? Are you shell shocked? You just want to get off the line? I'm pretty show shocked. Yeah, I know. It's a whopper. I know. I know it is. Um, if it's any consolation to you, it's not as bad as it used to be. I used to go deeper into this with my classes, and I realized that you know I was getting some mutinies in my in my in my classes, <laughs> people dropping out and in tears and running away scared. He's so mean. Data rates don't go. <laughs> so. Um, if you need any help with it, if you have any problems, just give me a shout. We'll work it out. It's not a big deal. Um, oh, the assignment is basically, uh, you know, we talked about that little data card, right? So if you go to web courses and uh, where is it? I closed it. Um, go to the assignment. Um, this little widget right here, it's I think seven questions. It's asking you what uh, each of these letters is pointing to, with the exception of H. Uh, I don't care. Uh, H is only something that SanDisk uses. A, uh, it's new for them. It's something that a couple of the other capacity, the uh, competitors are doing. Um, they're trying to, you know, give you another speed standard to slice this onion with, and I don't think we need it. So I just asked you what A through G are talking about, and it's multiple choice. So. Check it out, turn it in by, uh, what is it? January, it's next week, I think. Sunday at midnight, something like that. And that's it, okay guys? The lone survivors, who have I got left? Let's see, some of these people went to their name card. Oh man, I lots of people bailed out. <laughs> like rats from a burning ship. <laughs> run run don't walk okay we still got quite a few folks left that's cool you guys are the brave ones you are the ones with the fortitude to go the whole way i applaud you for your dedication uh if we don't have any questions though i'll let you guys go because i know this was a long one and who wants that anybody going once going twice going chicken soup with rice all right, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Okay. Like I said, shoot me an email if you got a question. Otherwise, have a good weekend. Enjoy the assignment. I think it's pretty quick and easy. You shouldn't have any trouble with it. You're all expert cinematographers at this point. Um, and I'll see you guys, what, next week, next Monday. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. See you.